you need a references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPE, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPE widget, or Type serp-p.pids.gov.ph Serpy has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, Serpy has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, 
na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, Serbia has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. Serbia provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual forum of the CERP Knowledge Sharing Webinar Series. I am Sheila CR. I lead the Knowledge Dissemination Program of PIDS, which includes the Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, or CERP. Friends, we are kicking off this uh, webinar series with a forum that features relevant studies of CERP partner institutions, tackling key lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, and recommendations for the future administration to, to better prepare the country for future crisis and to move forward sustainably and inclusively from this pandemic. We have an excellent selection of papers in agriculture, health, labor, and education contributed by esteemed researchers from our CERP partner institutions. To officially open our virtual event and give us more information about CERP and today's forum, let us listen to Dr. Anisetu Arbeta Jr., the president of PIDS and the person who conceived SERP more than 20 years ago. Dr. Arbeta? 
Thanks, Sheila. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the following officials who took the time from their best schedules to join us today. From the government, uh, let me acknowledge National Economic and Development Authority under Secretary Mesidita Sombilia, Department of Education under Secretary uh, Justado San Antonio, Department of Agriculture Assistant Secretary Agnes Catherine Miranda, Directors, Regional Directors, Executive Directors of the House of Representatives, uh, Congressional Policy and Budget Research uh, Department, Department of Agriculture, Department of Education, National Economic and Development Authority, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, uh, Philippine Competition Commission, Office of Civil Defense, uh, Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, National Tax Research Center, DOST, DOST uh, Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and uh, Natural Resources Research Development and Agricultural Credit Policy Council. From PIDS, let me welcome the former, my predecessor, PIDS President, uh, uh, Dr. Serial Reyes. Uh, from the academe, let me acknowledge the following, Agusan del Sur College of Agriculture and Ag Technology President, Joy Capistrano and Vice President for Administration, Finance and Planning, Car Carmelo Lianto. Uh, University of San Carlos uh, President Narciso Silian and Assistant Vice President for Administration Melchor Fuerzas. University of the Philippines Birata School of uh, Business Dean Joel Tan Torres. University of the Philippines uh, Mindanao Dean Aurelia Luzbiminda Gomez. Manila Central University Dean Milvin Miranda. Philippine Institute of Certified uh, Public Accountants Lawag City Chapter Dean Ag Angelina Obrahina, Obrohina, and Philippine Normal University Mindanao Associate Dean Lisel Banawag, directors from the University of San Carlos, University of Visayas, and Northeastern Mindanao Universities. From the CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have the International uh, Labor Organization Director Khaled Hassan, uh, Masaganang Sakahan, uh, Director Daniel Agustin. Uh, let me welcome also our friends from the media. And I'd like also to get our guests, colleagues, and from the government, academic, so, so civil society, media, private sector, and those watching this forum through the PIDS Facebook and SERP community Facebook pages. I welcome you all to this virtual forum organized by the Socioeconomic Research Portal of the Philippines Project or SERP, launched in September. Uh, 2000 SERP is an initiative of the Philipp of PIDS designed to serve a common link between government and research institutions to provide an open access repository of socioeconomic information that policymakers, education, and students can use. What started as an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by PIDS, other government agencies, and academic and research institutions in the Philippines has evolved into a network of institutions with a shared passion of knowledge generation and exchange. At present, SERP network consists of 50, 58 partner institutions. Last year, we welcomed several new members, including DLSU, DLSU GCM Rubredo Institute of, of Governance, the Development Academy of the Philippines, the Regional Offices of the National Economic and Development Authority in Mimaropa, Cordillera Administrative Region, Central Visayas, and the Sambuanga Peninsula. This year, the NEDA offices of Cagayan Valley, Calabar Zone, and Northern Mindanao also joined SERP. PIDS is overwhelmed with joy, and, with joy and gratitude for our growing SERP family. Increasing support of the research community and other government agencies motivates us to work harder in further uh, developing SERP and cultivating our network to serve as an avenue for promoting research and stimulating innovations for the public good. Thus, today, we are launching the SERP Knowledge Exchange Webinar Series, uh, which will feature the research outputs of our partner institutions to give our network members a wider platform to disseminate uh, their studies and engage with the public. We choose the theme learning and uh, moving forward from COVID-19 pandemic recommendations for, incoming, uh, for the incoming administrations for our initial offering. Every election is a turning point in a nation's history and its outcome will determine its direction in the succeeding years. However, our national election in May 19 is more crucial than ever as we will still uh, be recovering from the effects of the pandemic, which is still in our midst. 
we should heed the lessons uh, we have learned from this pandemic and aim for a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable economy and society. As members of the Research and Development Committee, we can assist our incoming leaders at the national and local levels by carrying out studies that can help them make more informed decisions. We must continue to promote the use of data and evidence-based evidence in policy making. Facts are what our policymakers need to make more informed and evidence-based decisions to craft relevant policies and programs that will address uh, the most pressing needs of the country as we continue to battle this pandemic. We also need facts to perform our duty to our country uh, the, most, uh, the most responsibly and productively as possible. I want to extend my sincerest appreciation to the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, the LSU School of Economics, and the Angel King Institute of Economics and Business Studies, and the UL Institute for Labor Studies for accepting our invitation to contribute a paper for this webinar. We will hear presentations of CISCHERCA Director Dr. Dr. Glenn Gregorio on urban agriculture, Director Pamela Diaz Manalo and Mr. Edri Juan Do of, of CPBRD on syntaxes implementation and health expenditure earmarking, Dr. Jason Allen Sorin of DLSU School of Business on the challenges of Filipino workers during the pandemic, and Mr. Raymond Estrella of DOLE ILS on the Filipino uh, health workforce. I will also be sharing my my paper on uh, uh, Philippine education. May I also thank CPBRD Executive Director Novel Bangsal for accepting our invitation to moderate the open forum. As, as, as I mentioned before, this is the initial offering of our SERPI webinar series. We will feature the studies of the SERPI partner institutions in succeeding fora. Let us participate in this discussion by listening to the presentations with an open and inquiring mind. It has now is not hesitate to ask questions and share our ideas as well. Thank you, and I will give back the floor to the, the Master of Ceremonies, Chile. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abeta. Friends, uh, allow me to remind you about our, our house rules, especially for those who are joining us uh, for the first time. So to join the open forum, simply use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of the WebEx screen. Just type your name and your affiliation and your question and send it to all panelists or to everyone and not to a particular person. The moderator will read your questions uh, during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions concise. And for our viewers on Facebook, you are also very much welcome to participate in a discussion. Just type your question in the comment section. Uh, we will uh, select up to two questions. And also, please be reminded that Aside from streaming this event on Facebook, we are also recording it and we will be uh, making the recording public, publicly accessible on the P PIDS YouTube channel and, and on the SERPI website. We have a jam packed program, so let us start the ball rolling. But before that, may I request all our speakers, including our moderator, to turn on your video for a brief photo opportunity. Uh, Gwen, kindly give us the cue. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. I'm um, just waiting for other speakers to turn on their videos. Sir Novel. All right. Um, let me just check. All right. Okay. Please give us your best smile in a three, two, one. One. Okay. One more. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Thank you. Back to you, Ma'am Shida. Thank you very much, Gwen. So at this point, I invite all of you to listen to our presentations. And our first presenter is Dr. Glenn Gregorio, who will talk about urban agriculture. Dr. Um, Glenn is the director of the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, or CIRCA. He is also a professor at the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Recently, Dr. Gregorio was appointed Chairman of the Technical Panel for Agriculture by the Commission of Higher Education and Steering Committee Member of the Department of Agriculture uh, Biotechnology Program. Previously, he worked at the International Rice Research Institute as a plant leader and senior scientist. 
and he uh, and he also worked as a crop uh, breeding manager in a private seed company and an agri entrepreneur and co-founder of then he incorporated an agri research startup company on micro propagation and seed business. Dr. Grigori has numerous publications and is a recipient of many awards, including the 10, out, uh, 10 Outstanding Young Scientists of the Philippines, Outstanding Young Scientists in the Field of Genetics, Honorary Foreign Scientists of the Rural Development Administration of Korea, and Outstanding Young Men in the Philippines. He was also conferred the rank of Academician by the National Academy of Science and Technology and is one of the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit Champions. Dr. Gregorio, sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good morning and good uh, evening to some parts, maybe some parts of the world. Uh, actually, what I'll be talking now about urban agriculture and uh, how, uh, what policy interventions are needed or necessary to promote urban agriculture as a way of life. So everyone, because of the, the likes of uh, COVID-19, climate change uh, phenomenon, this really caused us to be more uh, conscious of what we eat. It caused us to be more conscious. We, all the more will cause us to be uh, appreciative on agriculture, how to make the food, how to make food nutritious. So that's why I'm, uh, I'll be talking more now on the policy imperatives to promote urban agriculture in response to COVID-19 and even climate change among the local government units in the Philippines because everyone, I don't want that the urban agriculture that you are, we have been learning, the plantitos and plantitas, it, it will just be a fun, but we want it to be institutionalized in the local government, especially now we have the Mandanas ruling where the, the local government has more uh, option, has more uh, money to implement any project. And this is where the the implementation, the policy on urban agriculture will come in. I will try to share my slides now. Uh, okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, we can see your slides. I'll just make it into a bigger one. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So I'll just transfer this somewhere. Okay, so again, uh, I'll be talking on how to really promote urban agriculture by institutionalizing it in our local government units. So I'll be giving some examples on, on this one later. Uh, okay, so we have uh, one publication during the time of pandemic, sorry, it, it went. Uh, the time of the pandemic, which uh, assessing the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture production in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Just to give you the summary of this one, but if you want to download the paper, you just go to our uh, journal on Asian Journal on Agriculture and Development, uh, June 2020. So in conclusion, we'll say the disruptions in agriculture, food systems create a supply and demand, demand shock on economic performance and food security in the Philippines and the whole world. COVID-19 pandemic reduced the volume production by 3.11% uh, or that's uh, uh, about 17 million tons due to the decline in agricultural labor affecting more than 100 million people. And of course, the COVID-19 caused about 1.4 decline in the uh, gross domestic product of Southeast Asia. Philippines also it's 1.5. 1.4 and equivalent to 3.7 billion US dollar. Okay, just to, to summarize, these are the different programs from the from the from the government initiatives in Southeast Asia and the Philippines in response to COVID-19. You can see here in the last part, urban agriculture is very important. Uh, one of the uh, measures or one of the initiatives programs in in agriculture by the government, but how to make this institutionalized. That's what I'll be talking right now. So in here, you can see that the local governance on the ground, there is a changing narrative on how people view food because of the pandemic, how we view food, how we 
uh, the, the interest of growing food in our backyard or how the interest of how farmers produce food. And the urban agriculture is a conscious response so to pressing concerns about food security, climate resilience, and their overall uh, well-being uh, even in, in the midst of this urbanization and uh, increasing urban uh, population. So this pandemic has really underscored the connection. We, refer, we feel the connection now between the supply chain and the consumption patterns and the urgent need to redefine agricultural systems as food systems. So food systems na tayo. Also underscores the role of the local government units to cultivate stakeholders with a transformative mindset. So uh, who are adept on understanding the growing complex of social concerns and able to affect positive change now in the, and in the future. So you could see here that uh, the role of the different units is uh, very important to make, uh, to make our life more uh, in the, um, the new normal more smarter. Uh, okay. So I'll be showing you some various designs of urban agriculture systems that are really for your choosing, but that support for innov innovation that will be crucial to ensure it should be compatible, it should be scalable and applicable to conditions of a target adapters. Because we see some from the Western world or from the modern world, uh, urban agriculture, and we want to apply it in our, in our locality, but we have to consider our conditions our financial resources and uh, in our and, and the politics. Okay, so this is just example of the emerging ideas of urban uh, farming, which or agriculture, where you are all familiar. I just want to enumerate them: containerized, containerized, and modular farming. So, if you have a small area, you could uh, you could put your your plants in pots or in big uh, pails or uh, food that be, can be grown in containers. We can make use of recycled products, surplus materials, and use the energy of the sun to make it happen. So we have to use, uh, we have to recycle some products and within your area. So you, you could start small. Vertical farming, which utilize the height of, to maximize plant growth. In small area, we have different levels of plants. This type of farming could uh, be best utilized in integration and overall design and infrastructure. So you could have the uh, uh, example in the picture like this. You call it the vertical farming, maximizing the light, maximizing the space, and increasing the productivity. And of course, we have the closed loop system. We have the circular economy. Everything should be used. So this combines technologies on crop production, water conservation, water to energy, solar power, aquaculture, and this is based on the concept of nutrient efficiency through reduced dependence on external outputs. So produce more from your own uh, inputs. So those are the concepts that we want to introduce because some of the materials are not available. So what is what are the kitchen waste that you could use in your to grow your plants? So those are the techniques that we have to be uh, to be to inculcate in the mind of our consumers in our in our population or in our municipality or in our barangays. Okay, so these are the basic management. I'll not be going to the details of this one. This is very agronomy or very uh, crop science, basic cultural management in urban setting can be broken down into three general principles. If you are a plantito, plantita, you should think of these three and not go to the details. Provide unrestricted condition for free movement of the growth of the roots. So the uh, your 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 the roots of the plants are very important. So you make them soft, so tender, loving care in producing them. Make sure of uh, nutrients are there, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, you could easily uh, get those from your waste. Uh, from the kitchen or other organic waste, uh, easily available to the plant using, you could supplement it, uh, it with uh, microorganisms and humic acid. Make a strong root system using plant growth regular source supplement. What I'm saying is planting vegetables or any agriculture is knowledge intensive. You have to learn. Uh, Kami, we have to go up to PhD to learn all these uh, basic principles. 
but uh, what I'm saying is uh, it's a knowledge intensive. The good thing now you have the YouTube, you have all the, you could Google it how to do it, but you have to be selective what to 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 expect because sometimes the videos are showing uh, more than what we expect or we will just be frustrated. So start small and scale it out. Okay. I'll just give you an example of the some of the urban agriculture programs and projects by some of our local government unit in the Philippines, which seems to be flying and how the urban agriculture had been uh, harnessed in response to COVID-19 or climate change uh, that we are experiencing right now. Give me an example is in Santa Rosa uh, City, Laguna, Philippines. This is near Los Banos. The city government of Santa Rosa has implemented a pilot urban agriculture demonstration project as part of their effort to strengthen the city's climate change adaptation program, while also ensuring the promotion of safe and nutritious and fresh produce. So this is spearheaded by the city uh, Environment and Natural Resource Office. The city government of Santa Rosa has joined implementing the project with schools of the UPLB uh, and funding from the technical support from the uh, International Council of, um, of Local Environmental Initiatives, Local Government of Sustainability, Southeast Asia. So in addition to the establishment of the demonstration farms that showcase the several containerized and modular setups, selected bar barangay representatives undergo series of training on urban farming. So you can see here how they work the weather from the local government, from the international people, from the barangay level, from the UPLB academy, industry, government interconnectivity to make this happen. Another example is in the Siayan city of Monyos, uh, Nueva Ecija, Philippines, where they use hydroponics. And uh, that's earlier than when the COVID-19 came, it was, well, uh, it was more scaled up they see the importance of using it for food security in their in their community. So this is just an example. They collaborate with the Department of Agriculture, University, uh, to, and Barangay. So you could see the interconnectivity of the different uh, champions to make this happen. Another example is in Quezon City. So the Quezon City government launched the uh, Urban Agriculture Program. Uh, 2010. Sometimes they use it joy for urban farming program. So you know what does it mean? You see the involvement of the local uh, leaders to make this happen. So they promoted it in uh, Quezon Memorial Circle in collaboration with DA uh, Agricultural Training Institute. So you have to be creative to, to partner with the technical people to make this happen. So they distribute seedlings and make people happy and more because that uh, that area is a very conducive, very nice for demonstrating urban agriculture or urban farming. So this is just an example how it looked like in Central Luzon State University, spearheading they have the technology on aquaponics, and you could see the joy of urban farming program in Quezon City, and just show you the example of the pictures how the community has been involved. And these are the entry points of mainstreaming the urban agriculture strategy in comprehensive land use planning. I'll not be going into the details here, but if you are interested, really, I'll, you, I'll show you the website uh, or the, the policy brief that we, we made, and you could go to download it and see how it's done. So you have to look at the, we have the outputs from the, from the local government, uh, local uh, climate change adaptation, uh, program of the government outputs and look at uh, and look at how the comprehensive land use planning. You could see how to organize here all the steps going uh, from organization up to implementation, together with the implementation of uh, urban agriculture in the uh, comprehensive land use planning of every municipality. So the most important here is. Once the, the municipality are doing their comprehensive land use planning, urban agriculture should be part or, or you have to mainstream the urban agriculture there. So the entry point of mainstreaming urban agriculture study in local climate change uh, plans. So you have at their plan, you have the preparatory states to mainstream um, 
urban agriculture include ag agriculture office in the local in the local climate change uh, adaptation program team so that we have to organize organization of multi-sectoral team more inclusive approach in stakeholders analysis so all the details are here so in all the measures or activities they are doing you have to mainstream urban agriculture and uh, include them in the output so that it will be the output is very important once you include the urban agriculture the output for this local uh, climate change application initiatives or program LG envisioned a climate change resilient city municipality so you have to show that to the politician and they will be implementing it if you put the uh, urban the importance of our, our urban agriculture in their input so you have to be creative you have to influence different partners to make this happen and up to the planning budgeting so you have to mainstream agriculture identify urban agriculture's project programs activities as priority strategy so that you could get money from the local government under the uh, this uh, local climate change uh, adaptation program because they have the money there that you do put urban agriculture to be implemented okay so i just show here some of the policy recommendations to mainstream agriculture in the local government mainstreaming uh, urban agriculture in local in local development and policy planning organization of a uh, multi-sectoral team on encouraging champions of um, urban agriculture in the city and municipal and barangay so you have to involve everything up to strengthening the capacity of the barangay officials on urban agriculture inventory of spaces suitable for urban agriculture and secure security of land use regular capacity building and market developments sustainable funding and financing so these are the things you have to implement so if you want to go to the details of this we have a policy brief on on this uh, imperatives to improve uh, promote urban agriculture and this is the website and after this one we have this and we will be uh, giving out books now we will be printing the books of mainstreaming urban agriculture for climate change adaptation in the philippines which includes uh, covid 19 pandemic so in conclusion, I would say to institutionalize urban agriculture, the LGU in the Philippines must take active leadership in mainstreaming uh, urban agriculture, integrate it in the formulation of the comprehensive land use plan and local, gov local climate change adaptation plan, then complement existing programs of the Department of Agriculture. So you have to play around this one to make it happen, institutionalize it. Thank you very much. And this is the website that you could get the policy brief and give you an example also what are, how to uh, influence to, to institutionalize urban agriculture in, 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 in your community, in your municipality, in your city. Thank you very much. And back to you, Sheila. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Glenn Gregorio. That was a very relevant uh, presentation. I actually enjoyed uh, listening to it. Indeed, it's very important that we institutionalize urban agriculture. And thank you for sharing with us uh, some recommendations on how it can be um, sustainably institu institutionalized at the local level. Okay. So we will hear more from uh, Dr. Gregorio during the open forum. So friends from agriculture, let us jump to health, particularly on the implementation of uh, the syntax uh, law and health expenditure earmarking so we have two presenters on this topic both from the congressional policy and budget research department of the house of representatives and they are mr edre udaundo and director palm um, Diaz manalo edre is a supervising legislative staff officer and prior to joining the house of representatives he served as a tax specialist at the National Tax Research Center for 12 years, where his work centered on tax, uh, on tax policy research, fiscal data management, and tax uh, revenue impact simulations. He has a bachelor's degree in development studies from the University of the Philippines, Manila, and a master's degree in public policy from the Australian National University. Meanwhile, Director Pam Manalo heads the uh, budget Policy Research Service of CPBRD. She has a bachelor's degree in communications from Siliman University 
a master's degree in economics from uh, the Ritsumeikan University in Japan. And she also has a master's degree in public administration from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Edre and Director Pam, the, the floor is now yours. Um, thank you, Ms. Sheila. I'd like to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen, Pop? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, um, we would like to thank the PIDS and the SERP um, project team for inviting the CPBRD uh, to this knowledge sharing forum to present the findings of our policy paper. So um, this morning, um, together with Director Pamela Diaz Manalo, uh, we will be presenting the key findings of our policy paper uh, entitled An Evaluation of Syntaxes Implementation and Health Expenditure Earmarking. Um, so for the presentation presentation outline, um, I will first uh, give a, a background on the salient features of the syntax reform and also introduce the monitoring framework, uh, the paper used in the evaluation. And then I'll proceed to discuss the findings on the syntax implementation um, while the Director Pamela will discuss the findings on health expenditure earmarking. And then conclusion and policy recommendations moving forward will be, will be presented uh, at the end. So what is uh, syntax reform? Um, RA 10351 or the syntax reform law uh, was enacted in 2012 and is the start of the series of major reforms on the excise, focusing on the excise tax as a policy instrument to influence prices and demand of sin products. Um, basically, the law imposed higher taxes and um, simplified the excise tax structure of tobacco and alcohol products. It also includes provisions that earmarks the additional revenues from the law towards health expenditure. So the principal objectives of the reform are to reduce consumption of sin products and also to generate additional revenues for health expenditures of the government. So as we can see in, in this timeline, um, after the 2012 sin tax law, there are three more laws that amended the excise taxation of sin products and its earmarking provisions. So in, in the paper that we did, uh, sin tax reform referred to these four laws enacted after 2012. So the salient features of the same tax reform for the tax changes on cigarettes. Um, the, excise, the excise tax structure in cigarettes was simplified by, gradu by gradually simplifying, uh, shifting from a four-tiered tax schedule in 2012 to a two-tiered schedule beginning 2013, and then to a single tax structure by 2017. So as shown in, the, in this chart, um, in 2012, the tax rates ranged from 2.72 to 28.30 pesos per cigarette pack. Um, the rates are uh, depends on the net retail price of the cigarette brand. And then by 2017, uh, a single tax rate of 30 pesos per pack is levied regardless of the retail price. So we can also see that higher taxes are imposed every year since 2013 um, with um, RA 10963 or the train law. And the two recent laws um, in 2020 further adjusting the, the tax rates upwards. And then um, there's also provision of um, increasing the tax rates by 5% um, beginning 2024 to keep up with inflation. For the earmarking provisions um, presented in this, slides, in this slide are the provisions on earmarking of syntax revenues under several syntax laws. So basically, basically the earmarking revenues is divided into two. So first one is the allocations toward um, tobacco producing LGUs. Um, so the percentage of revenues earmarked depends on the type of um, tobacco produced in the LGU. So that's either Virginia, uh, Burley, or native tobacco. So the fund is used for programs that will support tobacco farmers um, who will be affected by the expected fall in tobacco demand due to the increasing taxes. And then the second portion of the allocation is on for uh, is on health expenditures. So sorry. 
So under um, RA 10351, after deducting the allocations to LGUs, the remaining incremental revenue is allocated to health budgets of the PhilHealth and the DOH. So that is 80% to the National Health Insurance Program and attainment of the MDGs, and then 20% to the various health programs of the DOH. And then the two recent laws um, just changed the formula of the of computing the allocations. And also, as we can see here, um, started to earmark revenues from excise taxes on e-cigarettes and uh, ano, excise taxes on sugar sweetened beverages. Um, um, so we use the World Bank syntax monitoring framework in the paper. Um, this is developed in 2016 uh, when the bank assessed the implementation of the 2012 syntax laws. So basically, the framework is used to monitor the impact of the increase in tax rates on a number of health, revenue, and good governance indicators. So for the tax implementation, uh, we will, uh, I will discuss the impact on retail prices, tax revenues, consumption, and revenue leakage. And then Director Pam later on will discuss the following indicators on expenditure implementation. So for the indicator on retail prices, as we can see, um, the tax rate increases under each of the tax laws have resulted to a significant jump in retail prices of cigarettes, um, therefore making them uh, less affordable over time. Um, on the average, the price of pack of cigarettes increased from 28 pesos to 98 pesos in 2021, which is uh, about four times the 2012 baseline price. So one key indicator to highlight is the floor price of cigarettes. So from a health standpoint, floor prices are crucial given the reduction of consumption um, will most likely happen to price sensitive consumers who tend to buy che uh, cheapest who tend to buy the cheapest brands. So as you can see here, the transition to a single tax rate in 2017 helped raise the floor price as cheap and premium brands are taxed similarly regardless of the net retail price. So the floor price increased from 10 pesos to 73 pesos during the period. Um, the same tax reform also addressed the low tax share of um, retail price. So the tax share um, increased from uh, low 29% in 2012 to 74% to in 2014. So for reference, um, the WHO recommends that the tax share to get the 70% of the retail price of cigarettes. And then the, uh, another indicator is the retail prices relative to the international prices. So the cost of cigarettes in the Philippines is still considered cheap um, relative to international prices. But um, given that there are already scheduled tax increases annually, uh, the country's ranking can further improve moving forward. So right now, 100 pesos per pack ang, ang, ang cigarettes in the Philippines. In terms of tax revenues, um, since tax revenues improved significantly um, from an average of 53 billion in 2010 to 2012, it almost doubled in 2013 at 105 billion and posted um, continuous growth rates uh, before reaching 261 billion in 2021. The same tax effort also improved to 1.4% of GDP in 2021 from only 0.5% uh, during the present during the pre-SIN tax reform. Um, SIN tax revenue still managed to grow year on year in 2020. So as, as you can see in the graph, um, it increased to 1% one, uh, 1 in 2020. Um, this, this is despite the, despite the, cost, uh, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, on the other hand, the most, most types of BR taxes declined during the year. So the additional taxes from SIN tax reform um, is crucial given it's earmarked annually to health expenditure, um, especially in the context of the country's um, tight fiscal space and the uh, ongoing pandemic. So this is a very important question uh, to answer. Why are SIN taxes effective in generating generating revenues? So a good combination of uh, a combination of good tax design. Uh, meaning there are yearly tax adjustments and a uh, simple single excise tax structure plus the consumer response to the increase in cigarettes makes syntaxes a good source of revenues. 
So we can measure this consumer response by estimating the price elasticity of demand. The CPBRD estimates price elasticity of cigarette demand to be inelastic at negative uh, 0.83. So this means a 10% increase in price or tax will only result in an 8.3% decrease in cigarette removals. So uh, uh, the charts on the right uh, shows the data on removals and excise tax collection. So while cigarette removals are declining, excise tax revenues continue to trend upwards. Um, this means that excise, the increase in taxes is growing at a faster rate uh, relative to the reduction in consumption. Um, we also, the paper also um, projected the uh, the cigarette removals beginning 2022 to 2024. So um, based on the estimates, given that um, cigarette demand is inelastic, syntax revenues will remain to be a stable source of um, government revenue in the medium term, um, as the tax increases will more than offset the decrease in the removals. Um, in terms of the indicator in consu of consumption, um, based on the survey data, Smoking prevalence among adults declined over the years since the STL in 2013. However, um, the latest survey to monitor the impact of the STL um, gives a different um, conclusion. So I just will highlight the points. Smoking prevalence worsened from 24% to 28%. There are more daily smokers relative to, the, to previous years. And then 6 out of 10 smokers developed their smoking habit in their early teenage years and then only 56 percent of smokers are aware of the stl so clearly there are um, still room for improvement in terms of reducing consumption um, um for the indicator on reven revenue leakage um the increase in smoking prevalence plus the decrease in tax paid removals is a sign that a portion of cigarette consumption is from illicit trade Estimates show that share of illicit cigarettes consumption ranges from 8% to 23% of total consumption. And then based on DOC reports, the estimated value of seized smuggled tobacco products averaged 3.4 billion from 2019 to 2021. The paper also estimated that the government is losing an average of 21 billion in excise taxes per year um, during the period 2016 to 2019. As that's for the uh, evaluation of the tax implementation, I would like to turn over to Dr. Pamela for the expenditure earmarking. Thank you. Thank you, Edre. Sorry. Um, I'm going to present our initial findings on the implementation of expenditure earmarking of syntax revenues. And we are basically looking at three things, earmark spending to tobacco producing LGUs, earmark spending for health and the expansion of the health insurance coverage. So first on earmark spending to tobacco growing LGUs, we look at the allocation and utilization of LGU shares. So the graph shows that the amounts accruing to LGUs from excise taxes on tobacco grew from about 6 billion in 2012 to about 25 billion in 2019. And about 84% of that goes to Virginia tobacco growing LGUs. That would be the blue bar in the graph. The remaining 16% is shared among provinces producing burly and native uh, tobacco. While we have accounted for the allocation of the LGU shares, uh, reports on the actual releases from the DBM central office have not been very clear to allow us to determine the levels of unreleased shares on annual basis. So what we did also was to check on the compliance of LGUs on their postings of the our quarterly reports in terms of the utilization of funds and status of projects and accomplishments or what they call the RFUSPA. They're required to post these reports in their respective websites. And we found that there were only three out of the 20 provinces that posted these reports and there were missing information in terms of finance either in financial data or uh, physical accomplishment so in the absence of a regular audit and a systematized mne and the utilization of lgu shares we looked into the special audit reports of the commission and audit on nine municipalities in the province of isabella we feel that the issues that the 
and findings of the COA indicates uh, the issues that need to be addressed to improve the overall implementation and oversight of the earmark funds. So just briefly, what we noted among the audit findings relate to one, unqualified beneficiaries and double claims, and this is the most predominant uh, audit finding. Second, procurement-related irregularities like the issues and eligibility of uh, contractors for infrastructure projects. Third, issues in project selection and implementation, such as the use of funds for ineligible projects or those not specified in the annual investment program. There were also findings as to realignment of funds for other projects uh, that were not uh, initially submitted to the DBM and issues of quality or non-implementation or delay. There were also findings on financial irregularities or questionable disbursements and the lack of monitoring and evaluation. Next, uh, we look at earmark spending for health. Here we tried to look into the contribution of the syntax in incremental revenue or STEER, the contribution of STEER to the health budget, identify the health programs benefiting from STEER, and also the budget utilization of selected programs funded by STEER. So the graph shows that syntax revenues for health has significantly increased the annual budget for DOH, OSEC, and PhilHealth. In the graph, you see the red bar that represents the syntax earmark for health. So from 34 billion or 39% in 2014, earmark revenues from syntaxes account for 94 billion or 54% of the combined budget of DOH, OSEC, and field health. Out of the total steer for health, it was mentioned earlier that 80% goes to NHIP the attainment of MDGs and health awareness programs. And 20% is intended for medical assistance to indigents and the health enhancement facilities uh, program of the DOH. Next slide, Edre. So from the 80%, we found that the biggest chunk uh, of the STEER for health supports the NHIP for the enrollment in field health. And this is really the intention to increase uh, coverage under field health. So we found steady increase in allocation to field, to the NHIP from 23 billion in 2014 to 59 billion in 2020, or an average share of 63% of total steer. The approved budget for the NHIP per the GAA consistently grew also from 2014 to uh, 2020, and during that period, STEER contributed between 64% and 82% of the approved budget level of the NHIP. We also found increasing importance placed on the attainment of MDGs, and it accounted for an average of 9% of total STEER. And contribution of STEER grew as approved budget for MDGs increased. So we noted the highest contribution of steer to MDGs, to the budget for MDGs at 62% in 2017. Meanwhile, from the 20%, the um, Health Facilities Enhancement Program, or HFEP, next slide, Edre, as is a financial assistance under the Health Enhancement Facilities program starting 2018 is the main vehicle through which NG provides assistance to healthcare facilities for infrastructure improvement or equipment upgrade. So what we found is that the contribution of syntax incremental revenues grows as total approved budget for HFEP declines. So that means more dependence on the um, syntax revenues in terms of uh, funding for HFEP. So in 20 18, for example, the HFEP budget was at 30.3 billion, of which 27.3% is attributed to uh, STEER. In 2020, the HFEP budget was 8.4 billion, of which 93.5% is from syntax incremental revenues. Medical assistance to indigents or the MAP is fully funded by STEER, and on average, it accounts for about 9% of total steer. So nominally, it has also been 
growing and it peaked to about 10.5 billion in 2020. Next slide. So we see actually also growing contribution of the syntax revenues to budgets of other health programs, although relatively smaller compared to the uh, previous programs that I just discussed. And these are the health awareness programs, service delivery networks, and health sector research development. So next slide. We'd like to uh, present to you uh, our findings on the budget utilization of select programs funded by uh, syntax incremental revenues. So we found that um, there have been declining uh, obligation and disbursement rates for uh, some programs. So for example, the MAP or the medical assistance, it posted declining obligation rate and disbursement rate. The HFEP obligation rate ranged between 75% and 94%, but uh, notably the disbursement rates were dismally low, especially in 2019, which was only at 12.7%. In terms of preventive health programs, for the attainment of MDGs, we also saw a declining obligation rate. So, for example, the National Immunization Program posted an obligation rate of 98.2 in 2018 and 43.8% in 2020. And disbursement rate was also low, even in 2020, at 28.4%. Uh, okay, so next slide. Okay, so this is just a summary table of, of the disbursements and the obligation rates. Let me proceed to um, discuss our findings and the physical accomplishments based on key performance indicators of some uh, health programs. So we found out that uh, we have unmet targets in terms of in some programs. Example for the National Health in National Immunization Program, the target is to have 95% fully immunized children. But DOH reported only 47.5% in 2018 and less than 70% in 2019 and 2020. For reasons like low vaccine confidence or procurement and logistic issues, even fear of COVID-19 exposure and limited, limited staff. We also have unmet targets in, in prevention and control of HIV because of some treatment hubs that were closed during lockdown. And the mobility and mobility concerns among HIV service providers during the pandemic. Also, we have unmet targets in terms of um, centers for health development and pharmaceutical and pharmacies in public health facilities, making sure that there are no stockouts of centrally procured major health commodities. However, we met targets for number of provinces that are free of filariasis, rabies, and malaria, except for the latter two in 2020. Okay. Next, we also met our uh, target for HRH, or Human Resource for Health Deployment. We met the target of 17 HRH per 10,000 population in 2018 and 2019, but missed the target in 2020. And in terms of HFEP, the target is that all HFEP funded projects must be started using current year's appropriations and the OH missed the yearly targets, although it had marked improvement in 2020. And some of the reasons being uh, are related to implementation readiness, like lot issues, uh, peace and order situation, or even limited operations of contractors during because of community quarantine uh, measures. Next, we will we look at the expansion of universal health coverage. Here, we look at the impact of uh, syntax incremental revenues as to uh, whether it has improved access to healthcare services. So the graph shows the spike in enrollment in 2014, following the increase in health budget due to STEER. Indirect contributors, that would be the red the red bar, indirect contributors would be the subsidized sector among PhilHealth members. So the membership among indirect contributors increased by 60% in 2014, 
particularly because of increased enrollment among indigents. And in 2015, the enrollment growth can be attributed to the mandatory coverage of senior citizens. Higher enrollment among direct contributors, that would include us, those in the employed sector or self-earning individuals, as represented by the blue bar. Increase in membership due to enrollments of OFWs, of additional self-earning and employed uh, and members from the employed sector. Enrollment rate in 2021 is recorded at 89%. If you look at a closer look at the enrollment among indirect contributors or the subsidized sector, we see that enrollment is still highest among indigents, even if it accounts for the overall decline in membership of indirect contributors. So PhilHealth membership among senior citizens increased, as you see the orange bar, while that of the indigents and those under the sponsored program in blue and red, red bars declined. So as of 2021, the membership share shows that 65% is our indigents, about 30% are senior citizens, and the remaining four are under the sponsored program. Next slide. Another indicator that we use to evaluate improvement in access or use of health services is to look at the benefit paid, uh, the benefit claims that were paid by membership group. As you will see in the graph, the direct contributors accounted for 75% of total paid claims in 2012 to 2014. That would be the blue, red, up to the black bars. That would be the direct contributors. However, we, we saw a shift in the distribution of paid claims in 2015 in favor of indirect contributors, now having an average share of 45 to 53% in 2015 to 2021. The PhilHealth also reports on support value. And it um, reported a support value of 66% in 2019. That means that for every 100 pesos cost of hospital confinement, PhilHealth covers about 66%. Uh, Next slide. Oh, okay. So we saw that uh, after going through the health budget and the performance accomplishment of uh, the DOH and PhilHealth, we saw that health indicators and budget utilization were actually affected during the pandemic in 2020, and we need to work towards achieving our health targets and likewise improve on the utilization of the funds that we are uh, budgeting for health. So we have identified some recommendations. One, we need to support deployment of HRH to areas with low HRH population ratio and to geographically isolated areas and financially constrained LGUs. Second, we need to strengthen the capacities of public health facilities to improve the general quality of services that are often availed by poorer households. Lower levels of healthcare must be adequately provided in primary and secondary hospitals without overburdening the tertiary level hospitals. Also, the implementation of HFEP must be reviewed in terms of the equity and efficiency aspects of the program. There's also a need to build the capacities in areas of procurement, project monitoring and evaluation, and new normal interventions. Ill health needs to also conduct regular review and update of case rates to effectively reduce out-of-pocket expenses. So the, the DOH, meanwhile, needs to strengthen the design and implementation of health awareness programs on preventive care. In, we need to also improve the IT infrastructure of field health for more efficient membership database and speedy processing of hospital claims. Registration to field health must also be intensified, as well as the assistance in the on-site registration, availment, and processing of claims. And we need to create greater awareness, especially among poor and non and near poor, as to entitlements and benefits. The monitoring and evaluation of earmarked revenues for tobacco-producing LGUs needs to be strengthened 
by setting up a mechanism for easy monitoring of fund releases and timely disclosures on utilization and program implementation. Edre will give a quick rundown on the recommendations in the revenue side. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Pam. So for the um, implementation of the tax uh, of the SIN taxes, uh, it will provide some conclusion and recommendations. So the SIN tax reform provided a stable source of revenues over the review period, especially during the pandemic, uh, when fiscal resources tightened. Um, as mentioned, good tax design and inelastic cigarette demand will provide sustainability of tax revenues over the medium term. Um, having um, stable revenues from SIN taxes moving forward is critical in the context of the fiscal consolidation plan of the government, um, where a new or higher taxes may be imposed to narrow the country's fiscal deficit. Um, secondly, tax administration should be strengthened to maximize the revenue potential of SIN taxes. So here are some of the recommendations. Implement a tighter tax track and trace system involving reinforced collaboration between BAR, BOC, and TA. Um, they should have a common database that are shared to monitor the flow, flow of commodity. Strengthen and continuously update the security features of tax stamps to prevent counterfeiting. And then the government should also resolve illicit tobacco cases quickly. Aggressive enforcement of heavier penalties under RAs 11346 and 11467 can deter further illicit activities. Um, lastly, um, active, actively pursue international cooperation through the sharing of import export documents to reduce illicit tobacco flows. Um, another example of um, international cooperation is the potential accession of the country to the pro protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products under the WHO. And then in terms of reducing the consumption, which is one of the core um, objectives of the syntax reform, um, government should increase effort to raise awareness about the health objectives of the syntax laws, conduct regular educational campaign, campaigns on the harmful effects of cigarettes and alcohol use in school and barangay settings to target both schooling teenagers and out of school youth. And then monitor the results of the 2021 Global Adult Tobacco Survey, or GATS, to be released by mid-2020. So this will build upon the findings of the last national survey, um, especially with regard to the impact of the recent tax increases beginning 2020, pursuant to RAs 11346 and 11467. Um, lastly, conduct an annual review of the monitoring framework, which the paper used, and take early action on data gaps or concerns about the SDLs implementation on both the tax and expenditure side. Um, so that ends our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Director Pam and Edre, uh, for informing us uh, uh, where the revenues from SIN taxes go, and how, how it is being utilized, and how it is benefiting uh, marginalized groups in terms of increasing their access to health services. Nevertheless, as what you have seen in your research, the utilization of the SIN tax revenue is still fraught with challenges, such as the low disbursement rate and procurement issues faced by the implementing agencies. So, okay, from health, let us go to education, which undoubtedly is one of the most challenged sectors during the pandemic. Our, and our presenter for this topic is Dr. Aniceto Arbeta. Um, before his appointment as PIDS president in August 2021, he was a senior research fellow at PIDS for 29 years, wherein he led the education and labor policy research team that studied key policy recommendations and reforms, including the uh, Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program, the Sustainable Livelihood Program, and the Free Tuition Law. Uh, Dr. Arbeto also served as officer in charge and deputy executive director for policy development and planning of the Agricultural Credit Policy Council and Deputy, the Deputy Executive Director of the Policy Development Foundation Incorporated. He has a PhD in economics from the uh, University of the Philippines School of Economics and did postdoctoral studies at Harvard University. Dr. Orbeta specializes in applied economic modeling, impact evaluation, uh, social sector issues, dem demographic economics, and information technologies. He has published numerous papers on these areas. Dr. Orbeta, the floor is now yours. 
Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, can uh, we share the slides, please? Uh, the presentation that I will be uh, doing today is based on a paper done by myself and Dr. Pakeo. Uh, this is written in response to the request of Secretary, uh, NEDA Secretary Chua on a sectoral analysis for education. It's primarily, primarily based on studies uh, done at PIDS. Uh, the paper is being finalized uh, to incorporate the comments from, uh, we sent the paper for comments for DepEd and TESDA and UNCHED. Uh, it will come out in the next few days, a few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. The out outline of the presentation is, 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 uh, is structured in such a way that I'll answer three questions. So, so you, uh, uh, where are we now? Why are we here? And, and the way forward. So, and I'll start with basic education, uh, higher education, the next higher education, the technical and educational education. Next slide, please. Uh, let me uh, I summarize the, the, the state of the basic education in, in, in these four statements. One is that the Philippines are part with uh, countries in terms of school attendance. We are way below our learning potential and education continues to be a good investment. And finally, that uh, response to the pandemic reveal the challenges of remote learning. I will very quickly substantiate these statements in the next uh, slides. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide tells you, uh, this graph is the, uh, shows the World Bank data on expected years of schooling on the vertical axis and the per capita income on the horizontal axis. It shows that the countries compares well with its neighbors and aspirational peers in terms of school attendance. The graph shows that in terms of expected years of schooling, uh, we are better than Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and uh, Indonesia, and Vietnam. However, uh, uh, next slide, please. If we now turn to uh, correct that with uh, learning, uh, we, sh we sh see that we are very much below our potential. And the, the estimates that uh, the rate estimates that's done by the World Bank is that are, our learning gap is five years. That, uh, it means uh, the 45 degree line is the well, what your uh, that's supposed to show you where your learning is to your number of years of schooling. If you are below that, then that means that you have a learning gap. And most countries have learning, but our ours is a very big one. So what if you want to translate that a uh, five years, uh, five point five years of learning gap means that if you are a senior high school graduate with 12 years of schooling. You have only equivalent of 6.5 years of learning or first year in junior high school. So that's what what uh, actually it, it, it translates to. Next slide, please. Substantiating this uh, uh, is these three graphs from PISA, which tells you that uh, the, the this provides the relationship between uh, per capita income and, and and scores. And we are on the left, and and uh, and, and uh, we we already know that we are um, and, uh, we are did not perform well in that. And, and I'd like to note the two things here is that uh, we are below the solid line, uh, the, the solid line, which means that we are, again, uh, uh, below the performance in terms of our income. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I'd like us to notice is that uh, the graph was, sorry, this is quite small, but it shows that the public is even lower than the private uh, schools. Uh, in, 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 in sometimes even the private school is above the, the, the expected performance. So, uh, and this data tells, this is from PISA. So this is uh, PISA tests 15 year old uh, students. That's why I'm saying that uh, we, we, are not, we are in a crisis, uh, a learning crisis, and we are in a crisis for a while now, because if you translate this, this is 15 year old, that means that they are in school for eight to nine years already. And, and that's the, the performance that are compared compared to other countries. Uh, next slide, please. This is the TIMS results, which tests uh, grade four students, and the, uh, similar similar results. If you have, uh, uh, we are even further below given our income, and uh, next, and private schools still performing better than the public. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a good thing is that uh, if we, when you measure returns to education, it's still a good investment. Uh, it's, it hurdles the 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 basic cutoff uh, of uh, people who use usually 10% there. So it's a good, still a good investment despite this problem. So that's one uh, redeeming thing that we have. So that's why it's still good to send your children to school and, uh, and returns, uh, you still get the returns uh, than most uh, in investments. Uh, 
And uh, the last slide that I'd like to show is really an important slide because it next slide, please. And because it shows the, the response during the pandemic. This is a, a, a graph that tells you the distribution of uh, the distribution of students by mode of learning. And, and it's divided into elementary and the left, middle and junior high school and senior high schools. Uh, the blue bars actually tells you the proportion of students who are on paper modules, meaning they receive paper and they're online. The green one tells you the online. Uh, so one of the things that you can observe right away that uh, uh, in public schools, almost 90% are in paper. Uh, they, they are not doing it online. Uh, well, and this is the uh, result of the combination between schools, ability, schools and, and the households. Uh, and in the, the green one, they only see a little bit of a, a hard proportion of, of students in, in on, online uh, modes uh, in private schools. You don't see that in, in public schools. So but that's one important lesson that we are saying that this pattern in elementary and high school and junior high school and senior high schools is repeated. So most of our public schools are in public. So if uh, uh, this reveals a lot about the problems with, with remote learning that happened, and this is data in this school year 2020-2021. Uh, and uh, uh, that that should uh, tells us tell us a lot of things. And I'll try to. Uh, see the implications of that in, in the next few slide. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, why uh, why are we here? Basically, because we focus on access uh, to the neglect with quality. For years, uh, the issue we were solving was access, and inadvertently, uh, we, we perhaps neglected quality. We only uh, were uh, uh, awakened to this uh, in, 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 in recent years. Uh, essentially, so uh, the other thing that I'd like to, because we, uh, I th uh, my, our analysis that we failed to build the culture of understanding, learning, and informing the public about their source of national achievements. That perhaps because of our focus in access, we did not put so much attention, we, or we were not conscientious in understanding and learning the poor test performance of our students until the PISA and the team's results showed us. The magnitude, we fail to appreciate that uh, a vast uh, proportion of our students are below the minimum proficiency. Actually, the estimate is 80% of our students are uh, in PISA are, are below minimum proficiency. And finally, we fail to inform the public about the conditions of our schools and results of the national achieve, achievement tests. The literature is very clear that uh, the, uh, the public is a key partner because of the, the, the results of, it, uh, of tests are not just because of the schools. A large proportion of the educational outcomes because of household and community factors. So that's 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 one thing that we should uh, that perhaps we should be uh, learning from that uh, uh, we we engage our, our stakeholders in the problems of our schools. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, one of the things that we would like to highlight is you have underinvested in education. One of the things that you can is the proportion of our expenditures to, to GDP, and uh, we are at 2.8 in 2019, uh, compared to our neighbors, Malaysia, which spends 4.2 percent, and Viet uh, Malaysia and Vietnam, and 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 also Indonesia is even 3.6 percent. So we're not spend as our neighbors has been spending. And uh, our education policies have undermined better performing private schools, perhaps unintentionally, but uh, that's what the data is showing that uh, 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 the, our policies are uh, unintentionally perhaps uh, undermining us, as, 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 as I will explain a little bit in, in the next few slides. We failed to consensually check on the fidelity of, of the implementation of our major programs. For instance, in the case of the two programs that the Institute have reviewed, the implementation, there were problems in implementation designs. For instance, the, the uh, MTBLE, we find uh, uh, an, an, a, 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 a confusion on what is it all about and what's the, the, the purpose of, 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 of the program. And the senior high school, uh, we find out that even if we are, we are uh, uh, encouraging students to, to, uh, to go to employment after a senior high school, we see that most of them also go to college. So, these realities have to be uh, factored in, in 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 the understanding of the performance of the program, so that we can we that the program will really achieve the, the stated objective. So, uh, and we know that there are uh, guidelines that have been uh, that have been issued, and 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 and, and 
uh, we 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 think that perhaps we fail to check on whether the guidelines are really implemented and failed. We just assume perhaps that uh, because we issued the guidelines, uh, we thought that those were followed closely. But uh, as I've said in the two cases that we look at, they were not uh, followed as 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 designed. Okay. Next slide, please. So how how is our uh, what's really our way forward? Of course, the, the the improving quality is key. Now everybody appreciates this by now. The question is how do we do it? Essentially, so that that's that's uh, that, that, that's basically the uh, and and these are uh, we need rigorous uh, validation of classroom experience for. Uh, it's, we we appreciate appreciate that the the, the bed, for instance as 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 boost tooling decoded with us four pillars which, but let me just try to describe uh, to this to discuss what we should be doing in that so the first one is the first uh, curriculum uh, uh, curriculum review and update and that's being done and actually being released and we should be looking at uh, how this uh, has improved uh, uh, whether this this changes in, in curriculum has, has achieved our objectives and that's one uh, we actually uh, reduced our 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 uh, learning competencies during the pandemic from 14,000 to 5,000 and call it the most essential learning competencies. And we, we should know what happened with that with, with the reduction. Third one, uh, the second pillar of, 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 of the ceiling candidate is learning, improving the learning environment. Uh, so we should know which dimension. The PISA test tells us uh, the high prevalence of bullying. And, and that school discipline is a very big factor in terms of, of, of test scores. And we find out uh, an odd thing that our learning time is not uh, uh, related to the test scores. So that's we should look at what's happening during uh, uh, just learning times where uh, expecting it to be uh, positive uh, at, on your scores, but it's not affecting test scores. And the other thing that the teachers are feeling and training again, we ask them which dimension and how the PCA results is showing that there's no correlation between teacher qualification and test scores. So that's that's thing that we should be thinking about. And finally, engagement of stakeholders and what and, and the, the establishment of the edu education forum is laudable because uh, that's a forum where we continue to engage and inform uh, stakeholders on what's happening in our schools. And, and, and we know already, as I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, the public is a very big factor in terms of, of, of improving or understanding the problems of our school. So we need, uh, it boils down to the need to organize, uh, to promote a virtual, uh, what I call virtual cycle of teaching and learning. Teachers should not just be taught about how to impart knowledge, but actually they should be taught as well how to learn from classroom experience so that they can improve the learning correction uh, in subsequent uh, uh, meetings. Uh, thus, the, the, the DEPED should transform itself not just a teaching institution, but a learning institution as well for teachers and administrators. I, uh, we should agree on the clear indicators of quality. For instance, we should, for instance, a good one is would be a proportion of enrolled students who are satisfying the minimum proficiency grade, um, and uh, and consistently measure that on how our programs have improved that 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 indicator. Uh, uh, the organize continuously and, and, and assess the learning uh, and learn from education. We should be learning from our programs, as I've said, and, and, and uh, look at that and how it's implemented and what are the issues and whether it's achieving its programs. It should be part of our culture as, uh, uh, and, and we should be build that culture of trying to assess what was happening and learning from those things. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the systematically develop a remedial program. This is a, because of uh, of what the PISA is telling us that we should be very clear that that that, that we need a remedial program, and it should it should uh, for many students, at least eighty percent of our students, and then we should uh, target the those from the poorer uh, students because those are the ones that are likely to have a very large uh, uh, lags in terms of learning, and. Uh, uh, we should, um, rather than undermining the private sector, we should uh, expand utilization of the better performing private schools by using vouchers. And finally, I would like to, the implications that I'd like to address is that they, they should harness technology for more learners in education. I think the enrollment by modality is telling us that online will not work for our public schools because most of our students are in paper, not on, 
or not. If you just uh, provide online the schools, the, the schools, the students will not be able to access it. I think what's, what's needed is much more uh, uh, lower level technology, like for example, using cell phones to interact uh, between, to increase the interaction between between teachers and, and students. And that uh, to, inter, uh, to, to complement the paper uh, modules that they are actually, what they are actually using. They are not, they can't uh, access online. Only the private schools have a semblance of online learning. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I'm going now to higher education. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I think, okay, so five statements. Attendance is, is high again in, uh, for our income levels, qualities, and even and low in quality. I'm sorry, I have to go past because I'm running out of time. And quality is uneven and low quality equity access is remains elusive and there's an under, underdeveloped research and innovation system and the private sector is really being uh, 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 marginalized. Okay, well, that's the five main. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, as uh, the next slide will tell you, and I'll go ahead of the slides. Uh, that uh, tells you that our enrollment rates has been uh, at par with our, 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 the same thing as with our basic education. Uh, we are at par with our, our, our neighbors in terms of enrollment. Next slide, please. But uh, if you look at the quality of our, our uh, a very few universities is actually uh, part of the top 1,000 universities. Next slide, please. And uh, these are, the table tells you the, the, the quality indicators that are like less than 40% of our graduates pass the board exams and uh, only 20 percent of uh, before that uh, but uh, that's fine this tells you about the the equity that uh, seven only 17 percent of the poorest actually go to to attend uh, uh, higher education and like 49 percent it's uh, for for the richest and the next slide tells you that uh, uh, that the equity uh, next slide please tells you that the distribution even in in public schools is it's, it's not true that the the students in public schools are poor you it just just uh, evenly distributed they are they are actually underrepresented the poor underrepresented even in public schools so that's that's a, a thing that uh, uh, much more of course for the private school next slide please and uh, the the other thing that we, we, I'd like to highlight is a recent result by uh, Professor Dawai of, of the School of Economics, which tells you that entrance in UP is very much determined by income. And even in, 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 in so uh, in the competition for, for limited slots in, in higher, higher education, the poor will, could be competed out. So the, the, this slide tells you about uh, the other issues in the, the STEMs uh, graduates, uh, the underdeveloped research uh, in, in, in research and innovation has, has three components that the STEM graduates lack exposure for research is uh, uh, a result of the USAID stride uh, research, the earlier study by, by, by Dr. Vea on, on uh, academic uh, uh, industry, uh, collaboration is, is still at the in, in infant emergent stage, that's what it's, the term is used, and uh, the recent results by Dr. Albert and said that we have a limited uh, ECT manpower in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the, the tells you the, 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 the private sector is being uh, 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 the share, uh, the enrollment in, has declined by 0.8 percent annually since 2009. So that's what I'm telling that that the whether we, we it's by design or not, it, it, it is it's what's happening. And actually, the the free tuition law uh, exacerbates this. Uh, as this, uh, the next slide will tell you that uh, uh, will tell you the first. Uh, this next slide tells you that the first year enrollment. This is the first year enrollment. Uh, 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 Prior to the introduction of the senior high school, of course, it's deep in senior high school where two years we didn't have enrollment. But when it came, came back, when enrollment came back in 2019, we find out the public schools have uh, more than recoup uh, the enrollment that they have 112 uh, percent, like 17, 800,000 against 715,000. But in private school only, they were only to, able to recoup 69 percent of their pre. Uh, senior high school enrollment. Uh, so that's what this thing tells you. And uh, that's it, not shown in this slide is the telltale sign of our 
uh, of, of of job uh, education mismatch uh, done uh, uh, by uh, tracer studies. Okay, so why are we here? Uh, essentially, the uh, the low quality starts with uh, uh, in basic education. So what higher education is doing is actually mostly remedial of what is lost in basic education. And recent uh, changes in public finance, we don't believe that it will solve the equity issue. We are uh, uh, and 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 the education policies marginalizing the public the, the private sector. And the lack of exposure of the culture and academic industry is still uh, uh, preventing uh, for to have a uh, vibrant uh, R and D in universities. Next slide, please. So the higher uh, uh, we that I think uh, we 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 find we should find a better uh, uh, financing to in, include uh, to to improve the access issue. And I said that the uh, more targeted one is a bet, is a better. Uh, uh, method rather than uh, uh, block grants to, to public universities and uh, address the uneven uh, quality by enforcing rules uh, on, on closure on closing programs and and and, uh, uh, and uh, higher uh, uh, encouraging people uh, student universities to have centers on develop centers of excellence and development and promote uh, accreditation and uh, next uh, slide please slide please Again, uh, we uh, we we should be promoting the the we should be harnessing the private se private sectors and under their their capacities rather than undermining them, and of course develop our R and D culture. Let me try to uh, a few slides to for Tibet. Next slide, please. So uh, the. For our Tibet, I think the the ones that uh, the we have, we're seeing high uh, uh, high enrollments uh, in Tibet and actually certification as well. There is an increasing proportion of grad things that uh, portion of grad is coming from community based uh, mode of, uh, of learning and uh, and the sectoral distribution of grad appears to correspond to the fast growing uh, sectors of the economy. And there's a shifting composition and reasons for having Tibet. And that's that's that let me try to uh, go fast on that. And I think uh, go fast on the I, 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 I ran out of time already. Okay, CK. Okay, thanks, Sheila. I can take uh, time. So basically, this, this is the the uh, the previous slide. Uh, this tells you that the, the, the enrollment in Tibet is actually uh, rising and certification is rising as well. And this table is telling you that, that there is a, the increasing, next slide, is the increasing proportion is now on, on community-based uh, uh, community training rather than on, on, on uh, TVI-based or, 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 or industry-based training. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so this 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 graph tells you that the 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 fastest growing or the more enrollments is is going to a fast growing sectors like for example tourism and social and community development and information and technology which used to be top uh, uh, sector in terms of enrollment for Tibet has 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 gone down already uh, in, in the middle and so that's that's I uh, I think that uh, our reading is that it. it so the training has, has responded to the changes in the in the in the uh, growth of the sectors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the uh, this graph is very interesting. It says that 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 actually what the composition of trainees now is very much is very much uh, is very much. Uh, more like uh, the, the brown one is actually our 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 uh, uh, on the left hand side is the level of educational attainment. So you have it used to be that uh, Tibet is supposed to be for high school graduates, but what's coming out in recent data is that more college graduates, the brown one, and beyond are are in Tibet as well as un, uh, college undergraduates. And the right uh, graph is telling you the the, purport, the reason. It used to be that the uh, reason is for 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 uh, the top reason is is uh, for employment, but now it's up upgrading for skills. 
So it tells you that uh, the there uh, it reveals uh, what uh, people going into Tibet are are actually trying to to do uh, with their with it, uh, with their uh, technical education. Okay, so I'll, I'll, the implications of that I'll, I'll show in the next four slides. Next slide, please. So uh, why are we here? Uh, I think uh, we have not. Uh, 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 promoted uh, enterprise-based training well. I, I think TESDA has, has pointed out that they have actually have uh, TESDA uh, circulars promoting that. But somehow, uh, what's that's what I'm saying that perhaps when we when we when we do when we issue memorandums, we should check whether uh, it has an effect or not. But uh, from the data that I'm showing you, the the enterprise-based training which is supposed to be the best training because it is based on in, in industry is the lowest proportion of of, of output and uh, the highest proportions as i've said is, is community development so it's not uh, uh we should look at that and the emphasis on equity perhaps is is the one that that's that that figures the large proportions of community-based training and we should be because that that has uh, certain features that we should be watchful about and uh, so we should look at that as well. And uh, I think what our graduates are saying, are, uh, what our trainees are seeking are employable skills. So now uh, college graduates who are uh, uh, going into Tibet after graduation or even college students of graduation are actually uh, seeking employable skills. So perhaps it tells us that perhaps our tertiary education is not preparing them enough uh, to, to, the, to the changes in the labor market. So that's why they're backing up uh, uh, employable skills by, by going into Tibet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, last few slides. So the way forward, so we, we have to promote the responsibility of the Tibet industry. And, and we, have been as, we have been at this for a while now, but data seems not to be moving. So what, we, what this is telling us is that uh, test the issuance is, is not sufficient. We have to do something to, to promote the, the we have uh, to promote the, the the strong linkage between the industry and and and, and training. Uh, that's uh, uh, and uh, we uh, there's also the need for for uh, incorporating the Tibet as uh, 21st century skills. And and Tesla has been saying that they have issued as as uh, uh, circular as on this as well. So we should be checking whether the Tesla's training really included this because that. Uh, the, the the industry is saying that uh, what they are needed is not just pure technical skill, but uh, uh, 21st century is like relating, communicating what you need and relating with your co-workers and, and even, uh, so that's that's the thing that should be included in Tibet as well. They're not just hired for, for the skills, but, but for, for uh, other things beyond uh, the skills. So develop, uh, perhaps because of this, uh, we should, uh, Develop the capacity of test that to be to be testing on modalities on how to conduct trainings such that it would it would respond to the needs of the industry and 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and improve the 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 outcomes of 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 the the matching between it, between training and, and industry needs and we should forget we should not forget that as a, that that. Training is not just for for uh, equity purposes. Meaning that uh, basic training is is, uh, is needed for some people, but we have because of uh, changes in technology, we should prepare ourselves for high technology, uh, high uh, mining, uh, high precision equipments require high technology training. Uh, so that we should not be forgetting as well. Even as we address uh, the equity requirements, we should be looking at, at the high, because that, that's where technology is, 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 is moving and preparing our, 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 our workers for that kind of training. And uh, the last one I think I should mention is that the, the, the pandemic has tell us that we should be, we should develop our uh, flexible learning uh, delivery capacity. And I think the, the test the online program is, is, a, is a trailblazer in this space. We should strengthen that program. And, but uh, uh, as we pointed out in one of our papers that we should always remember that our, our the, the types of the clients that we have. 
Uh, it's not only in basic education, but we find also in, we don't have data for higher education, but we find also uh, from uh, the little uh, uh, survey that we did for trainees, the, 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 one program, for instance, had to lend them tablets in order to be able to access the online part of the training. And, and of course, there's still the problem of the hands-on part because uh, even if it can be done by simulations, our training institutes don't have equipments for simulations. And so uh, um, we should be uh, developing capacity for flexible training, uh, training delivery as well. And, and that, that requires investments. I think that's, this is my last slide. Ah, okay, I, the last slide is the, is, the, is the, so let me summarize the recommendations. One is focusing on quality. That, that, that should be, what that, 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 that should be our focus now. It's not no longer, we are no longer problems with access. That's first focus and how to improve quality. I think the next one is the, the, the one that will help us. We should build the culture. We should not be uh, defensive too much. We should build a culture of generating and reporting and discussing and learning from data on quality and performance. We should, uh, like for example, if we have a test, how do we improve our performance in classes? We have our uh, exam scores, right? Uh, are we afraid that looking at our exam scores? We should not be because that tells us what how, how much we have learned. So we should build that culture of, 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 of facing our issues squarely and, and ask, ask the help of everyone, because as I've said, uh, test course is not a problem of schools, problem of uh, the, the households as well, and we should be in, uh, uh, helping each other to do. And I address quality uh, equity issues better. As I've said, uh, the putting uh, money on public schools will not solve the problem because, as I've, I've shown you, the enrollment in public school is not pro poor. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's just evenly distributed. So if you, so if you provide a free education in public schools, you, you'll finance the rich as well. Uh, you could have targeted it to the poor if you want to really increase the, the, the number of the poor in our higher education system and develop a culture of R&D. This is one of the things that's quite a difficult, complex thing to do, but we should, be, we should, we should build uh, the system for that. And we should optimize the contribution. The private sector is there for, for, for and, and, and performing well. We should be using them, not undermining them uh, in terms of, we should make them contribute what, what they are good for uh, and, and, and using them uh, in, in, in any way. And of course, as the pandemic has shown that, we should be flexible in, 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 in uh, we should adapt flexible learning, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in public, in, in basic education or maybe in private, in Tibet as well, we are shown that doing online will, uh, will not work because most of our students are on paper. Uh, what will perhaps work is that providing teachers with cell phone load so that they can talk to the students and do interaction as they read the, the paper module. Uh, online will only serve the richer ones who have access at home. But not the, but most of our public schools are, are as I've said, 90% of our students are on paper. I think that's the last one that uh, we should be uh, strategic in terms of using in technology. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's my last. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sorry. Beta, for that uh, comprehensive presentation. Um, thank you for flagging uh, important issues in our basic education, higher education, and Tibet. Friends, we still have uh, two presentations, but uh, before we continue, let us have a short break. So um, uh, let's have a poll. No? We would like to uh, know your sentiments on the following question. Okay. Uh, and this poll is open to our uh, WebEx participants and those who are watching the live stream of, of this uh, uh, webinar on our uh, Facebook page. Okay, so the question is, which sector should be prioritized by the incoming administration in terms of reforms? Okay, is it agriculture, B, health, uh, C, education, D, labor, or C, trade and industry? Okay, so which sector should be prioritized by the incoming administration in terms of reforms? Agriculture, is it agriculture, health, education, labor, or trade and um, industry? So you may enter your question, your answer now. And for those who are still undecided, don't worry because we will keep the poll open until the end of uh, all the presentation. So just minimize the poll section so that it won't distract you. Okay. Okay. So, 
let us uh, resume the presentations. Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Jason Alinsunurin, who will discuss the challenges faced by Filipino workers during the pandemic. So Dr. Alinsunurin is currently uh, the Assistant Dean for External Affairs and La Salian uh, Mission of the De La Salle University De La Salle University School of Economics. He obtained his PhD from the University of Bologna, Master of Arts from the Ateneo de Manila University, and bachelor's degree from the University of the Philippines. He was also a visiting scholar at the Catholic University of Leuven. In the past, uh, Dr. Alin Sunurin also held consulting appointments at the World Bank, UNICEF, and the Asian Development Bank. Dr. Alin Sunurin, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yes, please. Right. Okay, let me just adjust a couple of things. Uh, is my screen visible? It is. You may okay. proceed. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this talk. So we're quite pleased to present our work, um, overwork, underemployed, and underpaid. So it's a joint work with uh, with Lawrence Dacuigui and Rika Soler of the DLSU School of Economics. Uh, admittedly, we just started this work a couple of weeks ago in preparation for the joint workshop of the DLSU and uh, NIDA, so uh, National Institute of Development Administration, based in Bangkok, Thailand. So um, we're still um, um, waiting for the last waves of the labor force survey. So, but uh, at this point, we're able to gather some insights, or uh, the data was able to give us some insights about the labor market dynamics during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, at, at, at any point you have questions, so please do uh, let uh, do let us know if you have clarifications as well. So, we'd like to really improve the the uh, this work. So we're, we're hoping to finish this uh, the final paper within the month. So uh, why are we interested in the, the labor market dynamics during the COVID-19 pandemic? So we're pretty uh, you know, aware of the reversal of economic gains that has happened among developing countries, and the Philippines is not exempted from these uh, exogenous shocks. So among the most uh, vulnerable during the crisis were, were, were women, uh, were children, and, were, and mostly the, the poor, th those who are disadvantaged, uh, economic situations and a lot of the workers during the time of the pandemic were actu actually moved out of their uh, of their present of their uh, previous employment, and so uh, we thought that um, uh, because the pandemic has brought unprecedented effects to the labor market, we thought of actually analyzing what happened and what were uh, what happened particularly for this paper for those who are presently underemployed. So if we're going to look at the economic strategies of most countries, we have seen that a lot of the economies were able would be able to go back to their pre-pandemic situations, like in this, this year or the next year. However, we surmise that the human capital of these countries will take a longer time to recover. So specifically in the aspect of uh, training, in the aspect of labor market transition, or to, to, to attain a gainful and uh, productive employment will take a longer time for specifically for a uh, certain segment of the population. So we thought that it would be good to understand or to unpack some of these struggles of our workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we found is that the fractures in our labor market are already existing even before, before the crisis. And the crisis was just able to unfold this into our, you know, in the present situation. So uh, definitely we need to think about forward thinking labor policies uh, we need to take uh, to think about uh, the the work life balance of workers, and uh, we also have to rethink about uh, the present situation of the minimum wages in our country. So for today's event, we will be presenting uh, stylized facts on underemployment during the pandemic and a couple of preliminary insights and bits of labor policy agenda. So uh, okay, just to have a brief. Um, understanding of what the broad aim of the project is. So we're uh, in our research cluster, the DLSU School of Economics, we have a labor research cluster. So we're thinking of generating timely statistics on labor market dynamics in the Philippines through a series of papers. 
So we'll have uh, thematic papers on labor supply, wage returns, and human capital and educational investments. And um, as one of the first papers, this one, specifically for this project, we'd like to focus on the questions on the labor force survey to, uh, that ask individuals if they're looking for additional hours of work and if they're looking for another job throughout the pandemic. So um, a lot of us were actually uh, were able to see the, the incidence of uh, unemployment during the pandemic, but very few people have actually asked and uh, have taken a look at the underemployment situation in the country. So by definition, underemployment uh, or, or, or are persons who have expressed desire to have additional hours of work in their present job Okay, or to have a new job with longer hours of work. So we're going to unpack this to between those uh, workers who are working below 40 hours and those workers who are already working more than 40 hours a week. So uh, the literature on, on underemployment during the COVID-19 pandemic is actually quite, uh, there's a lot of new papers coming out in, in, in a lot of journals. So a couple of uh, literature that we're able to browse through before coming up with a somehow a good design for this project, a couple of a uh, couple of things that we're interested to look into. All right. So what do we know already about the uh, the employment during the COVID-19 pandemic? So we're able to see this. So I think this has already been uh, presented by the Philippine Statistical Authority that the average total hours were before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So we have seen that there's a decrease in the mean hours work. So even before the pandemic, most of our workers are already working more than 40 hours a week. So on, on average, I think it's about 42, 43 hours across most sectors with the exception of the agriculture sector. And during the pandemic at the, the second quarter of 2020, we have seen that the actual number of working hours decreased substantially, uh, specifically for industry and services. So, uh, because of mobility restrictions, because of uh, because of um, lockdown rules, we're able to see that the total number of working hours have decreased. It has slightly recovered, although the average working hours between the pre-COVID and the COVID-19 uh, periods they still appear to be substantially lower than before. So, uh, okay. So this is what we uh, have seen from the. Uh, uh, from the statistics presented by the PSA, that the uh, among those who are underemployed, we are seeing that, of course, obviously majority of them are not working close to 40 hours a week, uh, denoted by the blue bars. And we're also seeing that uh, a lot of the workers who are who are uh, who desire more working hours are those who are already working for more the more than 40 hours, as denoted by the by the orange line. So we're seeing here that uh, there are more workers, despite working, let's say, 40 hours a week or five days a week, they're still asking for more hours of work. So we'd like to find out the reasons why. All right. So what's the contribution to the labor policy discussion in the Philippines for this work? So the empirical literature on underemployment and labor supply, basically, this is where we would like to go into. The, the, the linkage between the underemployment and the labor supply during the pandemic in a developing country setting. And uh, specifically, we thought that seemingly the, uh, the discussion on pay and wages with social protection among workers in the Philippines appear to be disparate issues. Whenever we talk about uh, worker welfare or the, the, wor uh, the, welfare, the well-being of our, our, of our workers, uh, we don't. We just think of the pay, and not. A, we don't think about the see the work life balance of our workers. So I think it's about time that we consider them, uh, because if we'd like to think of uh, longer term labor policies, I think it's a must. Okay, so uh, there are I think issues of precarity and vulnerability of workers during the pandemic. So which has uh, which has surfaced in the last couple of uh, months. And I, I think it it uh, it points it draws our attention to the lack of broad-based social protection among our population. So I think it's a must that we talk about it if we wanted if we wanted to have workers who are productive. So I think uh, these are are issues which need to be carefully discussed. So what did we do for this project? So to provide context in our uh, in our discussion, we started by looking at household level analysis because. We're, we're initially drawn to the idea of looking at what's the extent of uh, wage income inequality in the Philippines. So at the start, we are still looking at the at the family income and expenditure survey uh, during 
in 2018, and then we started looking at worker at, at the at worker level analysis. Uh, by pulling together the multiple waves of the labor force survey. So in total, we have more than 1 million observations for, for LFS. For the, we used the entire uh, data set for, for FIES. All right, so uh, just to begin our analysis, so we, we looked at the distribution of wage income in the country. And obviously, as what we can see, a, 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 jet, a large proportion of our population depends on wage income as as, as as, uh, as, as, the, as the biggest share of our total income. So uh, the, lower, uh, the lower income deciles, particularly the lower, the lower half, uh, they have a higher proportion of income from seasonal jobs. So uh, we, we see that about 30 to 40% of households in the Philippines depend on wage income for, for uh, in general. So with the exception of obviously the top 10% of the population uh, whose greater share come from other sources like entrepreneurial income, uh, pensions, and other sources. So if there are vulnerabilities in the labor markets, we can see that there would be implications to household income. And we see that it would be very, it would be quite, it, uh, it can easily push households below the poverty line, right? Particularly those who are uh, drawing their income sources from, uh, from, seasonal, from seasonal jobs. And if there are job losses, even if you have a permanent contract, like for, like in the case of uh, regular wages, it can easily push households into poverty or to precarity, precarious situations. So we also thought, looked at the distribution of the total wage income. So uh, what we're seeing is that the Philippines is becoming a highly unequal society. I think the data has been uh, has been published uh, pub, uh, published quite uh, quite often. That that uh, I think we have the, one of the uh, from 2003 to 2018, the Gini coefficient in the Philippines actually has decreased, meaning that the higher proportion of our population is holding a bigger share of the total household income. Like for this one, uh, like for the top 25%, the top 25% of our population holds about half of the total household income, whereas the bottom, the middle 10% hold less than their shares and the bottom 25% only holds about 7.89%. So if we're going to imagine the extent of, uh, if we're going to refer to the previous discussion that we uh, I just gave, that um, uh, the, the, the workers who, who belong to the lower income debt cell are, are more vulnerable. Despite, holding, despite that uh, uh, having a larger share of their income drawing from uh, seasonal sources, it can easily uh, deprive them or of uh, of uh, of potential uh, pathways out of the poverty line. No? So, yeah. So this is, I think, uh, one thing that we need to address. Uh, we need to think about whenever we think of labor market policies that uh, we have to think about those who are the bottom of of, of our income distribution. So, uh, according to the PSA, so it's from the same data set. Uh, the labor force participation rate was uh, around 60.5 percent during 2021 to 2022 and the unemployment rate has decreased from 8.8 percent to about 6.4 percent in january of these years so we are taking a look at the likelihood of because of uh, of um, being underemployed and we're able to see some initial statistics but what we decided is to look at the extent of underemployment across age groups and we can see from this uh, distribution which is one moment all right so we'd like to see i'd like to draw your attention to the broken lines here and you can see the des desire for more work has actually uh, quite increased during the pandemic so the solid lines represent the, the desire for more work across age groups and what we can see is that those who are already aged between 50 to 55 and 55 to 60 they're still asking for more hours of work, right? Despite being, you know, uh, closer to retirement, uh, the, 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 the proportion of those workers asking for more hours of work is practically the same for those who are uh, just started their working careers at 30 to 35, right? Yeah. Okay, so for the next slide, what we did is to separate these into uh, how does the desire for more working hours vary according to the working hours rendered 
So it's not surprising that those who are visibly underemployed or those who are working less than 40 hours to ask for more, for more hours of work. So we can see from here that before the uh, April 2020 lockdown, that the, their, the desire is around 30%. But after the lockdown, the desire for more working hours actually increased for those visibly underemployed. However, if we're going to take a look at the uh, uh, those who are already working more than 40 hours, uh, a lot of the of them are already work uh, are, are already asking for more than for more working hours, and the COVID-19 pandemic actually pushed them to ask for more. So, particularly those who are already working at 50 to 55 hours. They are, the desire for more work is higher than the national average. So, but we're, it's a bit worrying that those who are already working at, between these uh, hours of work are still asking for more. So uh, it already raises some policy questions that are these the kind of jobs that really pay for, for, uh, for, 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 for daily living in the, in, in the Philippines. So what we found it, what is, when we uh, look at the tables no, or we plotted how uh, what's the extent that, uh, that the pandemic has done to the underemployment situation in the country? So obviously, I think it's not surprising that the pandemic have worsened underemployment and reduced the consumption of overtime hours among the workers. So from 26.1% in January 2019, uh, the percentage of workers who rendered less than 40 hours increased to 51.28% in April 2020 and decreased uh, slightly to 40.4% in April 2021. So in 2019, almost one in three render between 45 to 50 hours. Afterwards, it is lower in April 2020 and 2021. So if we're going to take a look at the pay, I think everyone is interested uh, at the pay of our workers. So among those visibly underemployed, if we're just going to compute uh, an average, how does the desire for more working hours uh, vary? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, the average day, we find that the average daily wage for the visibly underemployed is severely below the minimum wage. I think it's not surprising because they don't render as much uh, working hours, and it's also below the cost of living. And what we find is that even for those already working more than forty hours a week, the average uh, daily pay is still below that of the minimum wage, at least for a lot of them and for the for the actual cost of living in the country. I think this is largely the reason, of course, it's not really surprising anymore, but we're presenting here as an evidence that the actual wages are not uh, sufficient. Uh, but I'd like to caution as well here is that the average wages that we're reporting here are nominal wages. So we haven't adjusted for the real um, for the real wages. So if we're going to account for the for inflation and the actual uh, increase in the cost of living during this period, we could actually see that the real, uh, the actual wages uh, being received by the workers is becoming less and less across these uh, periods of the survey, right? Okay, so part of our study, uh, we're also conducting a logistic regression analysis and we're able to see that, uh, okay, I eliminated the equations here and we're able to see that during April, 2020, uh, it triggered decrease in working hours among our workers. So we have this uh, regression analysis where our dependent variable. So we segmented the pop the uh, the of our units of observation based on the actual number of working hours rendered during the past week. So controlling as well for the survey periods. So we're able to see uh, decrease in working hours. Hence the demand for more working hours has actually increased. So, but what we find to be interesting is that there are uh, persistent regional variations. So it reflects the uh, uh, the differences in the fundamental economic structures of our of our region. Some are definitely much more agricultural. Some are more industrialized. So that's why the desire for more working hours have have uh, are experienced differently by our population. So you can see from this chart. So we're still finalizing this and writing up the the analysis. So uh, I'd like to I'd like to uh, draw uh, finish the presentation. So uh, again, this is still an ongoing work, and we'd like to hear your insights on how to proceed on some parts of the paper. So, but we'd like to impart, you know, or raise a particular question. At the end of this analysis, uh, who we bono, who benefits? 
So uh, there's a lot of precarity among our workers. And I think that's already uh, showed even before uh, be, before and, and during the pandemic. So the pandemic has underscored the vulnerability of a significant share of Filipino workers. So the extent of underemployment in particular reflects the scope of the quality of work available and the capacity to provide living wages. I think we have to draw our attention to that. So uh, we think that um, with this kind of um, analysis, we need to understand the desire for more work among those already working more than 40 hours of, per week, which could be signals of the following, and they could be mutually, they could be reinforcing each other. So as we have seen that there are persistent differentials between the actual cost of living and real wages received. So definitely, uh, we have also seen that the minimum wages have not been adjusted significantly even before the pandemic. So it draws a lot of our workers to work, uh, work more, uh, to to, rent, to ask for more work, right? Uh, there are also a lot of job contracts as shown in the LFS, which do not provide stable cash flow among our households uh, in just by comparing re regular versus seasonal wages. And another problem is that uh, there's a lot of education, job and skill mismatch across age groups, educational backgrounds, and across periods in our in our survey. So we also have to account for that. So um, um, a couple of thoughts before I end my presentation. So the Philippines in the 2020s will become a highly unequal society brought about by the pandemic. So there's, there's 2018 is already uh, highly unequal. So uh, the pandemic has brought about the uh, some of the uh, some opportunities are were not made available to certain segments of the population, so it could be very difficult for some of the workers to catch up. So we surmise that the underemployment may likely persist in the age of scaled up automation. So we haven't really talked about this. So I think it may it will substantially influence our labor market dynamics. So. Uh, Temporarily, uh, underemployment, okay, if I should have mentioned this at the start, underemployment indicates forgotten economic opportunities and the depreciation of human capital. There are studies in other fields in the social sciences that there are the, fr the frictions in job search is, is quite high. So some workers take a long time uh, to find a formal job contract. So in the time that they were looking for jobs, they, some of the, they could have uh, gained more skills or they, could, they went to certain jobs which do not fit their backgrounds and skills. So I think it's also, we need to address this substantially. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, therefore at the, at the end of the day, we could think of policies uh, for Filipino workers while living in an endemic COVID scenario. Uh, we should also think that the hybrid and flexible work may not be for everyone, but work-life balance should be, okay? Whether we are working for the government or the private sector or in the agriculture sector. So uh, we're still developing our arguments for this uh, for this paper, but we definitely underscore the need for inclusive labor policies, which are worker centered. And in a way, when we think, think about the reforms in the education system, we think of the learner centered approaches to increase the uh, the quality of our education outcomes. In the same way that in the labor markets, we need to think about uh, policies which are worker centered at the very beginning. So we need to upscale and reskill those at the fringes while protecting them from displacement and exclusion, whether brought about by another pandemic or by automation or by some any other, by trade market liberalization or by any other uh, reforms in the sector. So aside from consistency of policies from training, schooling to labor market transition, so another thing that we uh, also tried, would like to emphasize is that uh, a lot of our workers would also um, be trained for entrepreneurial orientation and 21st century skills or they should be reinforced throughout their, uh, uh, before they transition to the labor market. So I think that's it for now. So we'd be happy to hear your questions during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alin Sunurin. Um, it was a, a very insightful uh, presentation on our um, labor sector. Our next and last presentation is also on um, our labor sector, but this time focusing on our Filipino health workers who are our uh, frontliners during this pandemic. So friends, um, for the presentation, let's um, welcome Mr. Raymond Australia, Senior Labor and Employment Officer at the Institute for Labor Studies, the Labor Policy Research and Advocacy Arm of the Department of Labor and Employment. His research areas include human resources for health, platform work, and labor and social relations. He finished his bachelor 
of Arts degree in Public Administration and Master of Public Management from the University of the Philippines and is presently pursuing Doctor of Public Administration from the same university. He obtained a Certificate for in Training and Assessment from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia under a full occupational traineeship scholarship and is also a licensed professional teacher in the Philippines. Mr. Australia, the floor is now yours. Maraming salamat po, uh, Ms. Sheila, and uh, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity rin po to thank the PIDS team for this opportunity to present our working paper. Let me just share my screen po. Okay, magandang umaga po ulit. I am Raymond Estrella, the principal author of the ILS 2021 working paper titled Study on the Filipino Health Workforce, a Sequential Exploratory Analysis of the Decent Work Outcomes in Metro Manila, Metro Davao, uh, Metro Cebu Hospitals. Very proud to present our research team because we covered all pillars of decent work. That's why we needed expertise from the three technical divisions of the Institute for Labor Studies. We have contributors from the Employment Research Division, Workers' Welfare Research Division, and of course, the lead division is the Labor and Social Relations Research Division. A quick outline of my presentation, we have the overview and preliminaries, research findings, key takeaways, conclusion, and of course, our policy recommendations. To start, this study is in partnership with the Career Development and Management Division of the Health Human Resource Development Bureau of the Department of Health, primarily aiming to craft policies and programs geared toward guaranteeing a sufficient supply of competent human resources for health in the country and in accordance with the implementation of the National Human Resources for Health Master Plan for 2020 to 2040 and the Universal Health Care you want to provide baseline data of the domestic working conditions, including migration prospects of healthcare workers in the Philippines. And the output of this study is positioned to be used by the Department of Health and as well as the HRH Network Philippines, a multi-sectoral body composed of 18 government agencies and private organizations responsible for harmonizing policy directions to attain quality healthcare for every Filipinos. We also consider this important components in our presentation. Of course, the issues and challenges in our healthcare system brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as we all know as well, that our healthcare system is generally overwhelmed and nearly confronted the brink of collapse with our healthcare workers are mostly exhausted and continuously challenged by HRH deficit. And we realized the importance of HRH planning, management, and development for us to be able to secure policy interventions in the critical dimensions of the Philippine healthcare sector, such as the decent work situation, labor migration governance, and even uh, stakeholders collaboration. Next, for us to be able to address the demand of that policy agenda, our research objectives, mm -hmm. the study aims to provide a descriptive analysis of healthcare workers' decent working situation. Of course, we included their challenges and opportunities in the three metropolitan hospitals uh, areas in the country, Metro Manila, Metro Cebu, and Metro Davao. And specifically, uh, the study also aimed to look into the decent work situation, especially in the areas of employment, rights at work and working conditions, social dialogue, social protection, and even opportunities for skills development in our hospitals. And also mm -hmm. to analyze the implications of the domestic decent work situation, including the human resource development systems and practices on the labor migration governance of our healthcare workers. And to be able to achieve these objectives, the study adopted a sequential exploratory research design. We started with our qualitative data and then quantitative data and then the interpretation of both data for us to come up with the results and discussion. Also for our research methods, we use online survey for our quantitative part and mostly focus group discussions and some key informant interview for a qualitative part. Mm -hmm. And of course, this research of our available secondary data, especially data from the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And our sampling technique for our 
our online survey is stratified sampling method. We use the strata of location because we identified hospitals from Metro Manila, Metro Cebu, and Metro Davao. And we targeted at least 50% of hospitals in each of the study site. Mm -hmm. And for all our research instrument in both qualitative and quantitative part, we follow this domain or some sort of like a themes. Uh, we have the hospital profile, employment, rights at work and working conditions, social protection, migration prospects, and even the opportunities for skills development. And our study also honored the uh, principles of gender relevance and ethical considerations, uh, such as voluntary participation of, of all our research participants, anonymity, and even uh, gender neutrality. Uh, for this particular study, we had to secure an ethics review clearance because this is in partnership with the DOH and the research team was required to secure an ethics review clearance to ensure the safety of the researchers and more importantly, our research participants. Uh, the purpose of the ethics review clearance is to uh, increase the legitimacy of the research findings and to ensure that the research leads to beneficial outcomes. And on August 27, 2021, uh, we were granted by the Single Joint Research Ethics Board of DOH the Certificate of Exemption from Ethics Review. So we attach this certificate in all our research um, instrument uh, for the information of our research participants. For our framework, we also followed and take into consideration the decent work pillars and also the DOLE organizational outcomes such as employment facilitation, employment preservation and regulation, workers' protection and welfare, and of course, the corresponding domains, as you can see, uh, which you also use in all our research instrument. And I'm very pleased to present to you our findings. Of course, we have three main parts for our findings. We have from the employer's perspective of the decent work situation in the metropolitan hospitals, and we also have employees' experiences. And third, we also look into the decent work situation and labor migration of healthcare workers and the implication of migration in our healthcare system. Uh, first, we have the target respondents. So in total, we received a completed submission of 72 hospitals. This is an establishment-based survey. So one survey response is equivalent to one hospital. So overall, we uh, uh, gathered 72 responses and that translates to 109% in all the uh, study sites. And to be specific, in Metro Manila, we received 46 responses or 102 uh, response rate. In Metro Cebu, we had 13 hospitals. So that's 130% response rate in Metro Cebu. And in Metro Davao, we received 13 hospitals. Um, and that is 118% submission. For the hospital profile, among the 72 uh, completed submissions from our hospitals in uh, all study sites, 65% of them have the approved bed capacity of 100 to 500 beds. Next, 21% uh, have less than 100 beds. 10% uh, of them have what, 501 to 1,000 beds, and only 4% have more than 1,000 beds. And for the hospital size, a majority of them, 71%, uh, with small or with less than 100 to 999 employees, followed by 22%, uh, with medium, uh, with 1,000 to 100, 999 employees, and then 7%, uh, large hospitals with 2,000 and above employees. And for the number of employees, uh, the lowest employee uh, number is 69 highest is 5,371 and the average employee size for all the respondents is 765. And as to the nurse to patient ratio, meaning one nurse is to one patient, the lowest or the most ideal uh, ratio is one is to two. And uh, the highest is one is to 32. And of course the average ratio is one is to 10 uh, for our hospital respondents. Mm -hmm. And some additional data for our uh, hospital profile, the total sex disaggregation data, 62% of our respondents, uh, their workers are primarily female and 38% uh, of their workers are male. And also this is reflective to each of the study site. In Metro Cebu, 
a majority of the employees are female with 66%, 61% in Metro Manila, and 62% in Davao. And as to the employee classification, as you can see, 86% uh, are rank and file. And also, you can see the regional distribution in each of the study site here, Metro Cebu, Metro Manila, and Metro Davao, uh, almost more than half. 91%, 85%, and 83% are rank and file employees. And as to the age group, 60% of the total health workers were within the 25 to 39 age bracket. And some key takeaways from our findings, both from the integration of our, our quantitative and qualitative data. First, six out of 10 health workers covered in the survey are female. And this further supported the data from the 2018 National Migration Survey that the females dominate the Philippine health profession. Number two, 60% uh, of the healthcare workers were within the 25 to 39 years old or mostly referred or were very familiar with this term now, the millennial generation. Also, 75% of the hospitals follow the 40-hour working time per week, which is the standard schedule for many full-time occupation here in the Philippines. And of course, uh, this is in the healthcare sector and uh, our respondents are mostly or are all hospitals. Next, uh, during the pandemic, hospitals had different flexible work arrangements such as compressed work week, 57% of our respondents work from home, 49%, and even flexible working hours or flexi time, 44% uh, of our respondents. And as you can see here, uh, the pandemic really highlighted the emergence of these flexible work arrangements, especially uh, the compressed work week or flexibility in their schedule because they have to adopt to the changing requirements and schedule in the hospital, and as well as the number of patients that they need to cater each day. Moreover, for the compensation and benefits, I think this is an, um, an important slide as well, based on the study findings. Uh, of course, the salary of health workers in public hospitals is mandated by the salary standardization law and categorized usually by salary grade. Uh, but as you can see in the graph, the overall average salary in all of the hospitals, you can see public hospitals and private hospitals here. Uh, the maximum amount of salary of physician is 30,000 pesos. And this is primarily because they are mostly on affiliation basis and they also work in different hospitals and various hospitals in their area. For nurses, uh, nurses in public hospitals receive a higher salary range than those in private hospitals and it is the same case with medical technologists. On the other hand, uh, laboratory technicians in private hospitals receive a higher salary than those in public hospitals and also admin staff receives the same salary for both public and private hospitals. And for other positions, they receive an average salary of 25,000 pesos. And again, this data um, is, is from the 72 hospital respondents that, that we gathered from our um, quantitative survey. Uh, furthermore, while all hospitals comply with the prescribed occupational safety and health standards, uh, only 81% of the hospitals require a mandatory OSH seminar for employees, and uh, the OH, OH, OH law uh, require that, especially for new employees, they need to require the, to attend the OH seminar. Next, 60% of the hospitals do not have a labor union union representing the interests of the employees in the organization. Um, from the private sector, only 37 and uh, from the public sector, six. And out of the 27 hospitals that have existing collective bargaining agreements, five hospitals cover non-regular workers and 12 hospitals have included COVID-19 related provisions in catering to the demands and prerequisites of the so-called new normal because um, as you can see here CBAs also need to adopt they need to craft new provisions that will cater to the demands of the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, the needs of our healthcare workers are also changing and so the provisions of the CBA uh, for most hospitals. Next 17 hospitals have in indicated membership in the Hospital Industry Tripartite Council, which is very important to maintain uh, 
harmony in the healthcare industry. Uh, next, 17 hospitals have indicated provision of accommodation, for example, dormitory and in-house lodging and subsistence allowance, uh, legal and outpatient services. And this is further highlighted by the pandemic because most of the healthcare workers need to stay in-house uh, to prevent uh, the uh, further exposure to the virus, especially when they're traveling to and from the residents to, to the hospitals. Next, 56 hospitals implemented different programs catering to women's needs, such as providing breastfeeding area for nursing employees and a dedicated VAUSI help desk for their employees. And this is also reflective of our first key research finding because majority of uh, healthcare workers in the Philippines are female. Next, among the primary reasons reported by the hospitals for Poor performance include deficiency in soft skills, lack of expected behavioral skills, shortage of technical and socioeconomic skills, and of others, uh, lack of leadership skills. And as you can see here, while the hospitals focus on uh, position specific or very technical training for their uh, employees, we also need to take into consideration the soft skills training for our healthcare workers. Next. Almost all hospitals, 96% of them perceive that COVID-19 really impacted the availability of healthcare workers in the Philippines. And most of the hospitals, 85% of them view that COVID-19 also significantly impacted the quality of recent graduates in the medical field. Last two key takeaways. Uh, number 14, 13 private hospitals noted that around 20 to 29 of their workforce moved out of the country in the last five years and healthcare workers in the private sector are more likely to migrate abroad than their public sector counterparts. And last key takeaways, various factors motivate our healthcare workers to move abroad and the top reason has always been economic in nature, such as higher compensation and much better benefits in other countries. And from these key takeaways, we come up with our recommendations based on our framework which I showed uh, earlier. First, uh, recommendations for employment facilitation. Uh, I'd like also to note that our recommendations are mostly stakeholder specific already. First, uh, we need to strengthen digital health workforce education and training in the Philippines in coordination with the Department of Information and Communication Technology to leverage our online platform and provide available opportunities for our healthcare workers. Next, to reinforce competency framework for domestic health systems and international health labor market, because we also need to assess and ensure that our framework are still responsive uh, with the local needs and as well as international demands. Um, next, uh, we need to maximize the role of the local government units in the decentralization and health service del delivery in partnership with the Department of Interior and Local Government, because we need to ensure that the fiscal and managerial ability of our local government units are still responsive um, on their health devolved functions. Next, employment preservation and regulation. First, uh, we recommend to propose a competitive, equitable, and decent salary structure designed for growth for our healthcare workers because we need to uh, ensure that also review the social and economic aspect of a salary structure for us to be able to uh, respond to the needs of our healthcare workers. And this is in coordination with the Civil Service Commission and DBM for public hospitals and PRC for private hospitals. Uh, next, intensify labor education and encourage active participation in policy and decision-making process. We need to uh, empower our employees to participate in different social dialogue mechanisms in their organization because labor unions uh, are establishing partnership to be able to harmonize with the management. And um, next, uh, to boost the role and functions of the DOLE in enforcing compliance with uh, labor standards, maybe to add more um, functions to also uh, regulate private hospitals and other private health organizations to aid them in their full recovery from the adverse impact of the pandemic. And last theme, uh, for the workers' protection and welfare, we recommend to institutionalize the social protection floor uh, to be able to 
uh, ensure that all groups in the society have equal access to more inclusive, uh, sustainable growth and greater well-being. And as the lead agency, the DOLE is also committed to pursuing institutionalization of the social. And in relation to that, uh, we also need to ensure from a rights-based perspective that the level of benefits must also be adequate because this is not just for the healthcare workers uh, themselves alone, but also for their families. And lastly, uh, we also recommend to introduce support programs uh, for persons with disabilities, indigenous and vulnerable and precarious workers in the healthcare sectors uh, because uh, we need to design appropriate and responsive policy interventions and the Bureau of Workers with Special Concerns and the BLE, Bureau of Local Employment, the DOLE may introduce programs for these kinds of workers by providing them opportunities for capacity development, including other welfare and well-being programs. And um, ultimately, in general, we also recommend the continuous collaboration uh, with the hospital industry sector, supported by the DOH as, as the lead agency and also the HRH Network Philippines in ensuring the employability of our workers, uh, protection of workers' rights, and maintenance of industrial peace in the healthcare sector, and uh, also the recommendation for further health research projects to supplement our current baseline data and come up with more evidence-based and data-driven policy recommendations. That's it. Maraming salamat po uh, for, for listening. And thank you very much, uh, Raymond, for that uh, thought-provoking presentation and the situation of our healthcare workers. And thank you also for giving us important recommendations on how we can uh, promote the welfare of our healthcare workers. So, maraming salamat din po sa inyong lahat for your patience and attention in listening to all the presentations. Before we proceed to the open forum, may I request Gwen to close the poll now and to reveal to us the results of our poll? So Gwen, how many seconds does WebEx need to process the results? And more seconds, Ma'am Sheila. Okay. Okay, so um, okay. So we will uh shortly after this we will proceed uh with the QA. Okay, so let us look at the top three responses on the question which sector should uh, the incoming administration prioritize in terms of reforms. So majority of our respondents uh, chose letter C, which is education, followed by uh, agriculture and then health. Okay, um, so salamat po sa lahat na nag-participate sa ating poll and as a token of our appreciation, we will pick three names from WebEx and two names from Facebook and I will announce the names of the winners later. So at this point, I now give the floor to Mr. Novel Bangsal, Executive Director of the Budget and Tax Research Bureau of the CPBRD. Edi Bangsal will moderate our Q&A. Novel, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Babe Sorbetta and the PIDS for this opportunity to participate uh, in this knowledge sharing webinar. Uh, also, thank you to our uh, SERP network uh, family uh, for your active participation. And we hope to do this dialogue uh, on a more regular basis. So on that note, I will be moderating uh, the Q&A. Uh, I will be doing my best to cover all the questions as long as uh, time permits, uh, meaning until uh, 11.50. I, I think we, we have enough time for, for all the questions. Um, as, and as uh, Sheila has uh, said earlier, please be brief uh, in your questions. We have five, uh, uh, five different papers, uh, so I'm sure we'll be covering a lot. So I, I see uh, some questions already in the chat box, uh, and we'll also be getting some uh, questions from uh, Facebook Live. Uh, so let, let me start uh, with this question from uh, Director Dan Agustin of uh, Masagana Sakahan, addressed to uh, Dr. Beta. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, on TESDA, to save on budget, what are your thoughts if test the training be integrated with uh, DepEd's K-12, like that of Germany, Japan, and Singapore? Uh, on culture, so I think that's a 
that's the second question. Do you think it is time to integrate uh, the Binondo culture in our educational system as the Binondo Chinos are entrepreneurially, uh, entrepreneurially culturally? culturally? Uh, Dr. Babes, uh, can you comment on the question of Dr. Dan Agustin, sir? Uh, Dr. Arbeta, are you are you uh, muted or I think Dr. Arbeta is muted. Okay, uh, I think. Uh, uh, let me just proceed with the uh, with the with the question from uh, director also from okay uh, I think Dr. Babes or Beta is ready. Sir, uh, have you heard the question from director Dan or do you want me to repeat it? Please, uh, please repeat because uh, sorry I was being talk. Yes, yes, sir. Please, please. Uh. Yes, sir. So uh, his question is. Uh, he has two questions on TESDA. We, we say to save on budget. What are your thoughts if TESDA training be integrated with DepEd's K-12 like that of Germany, Japan, and Singapore? His second question is on culture. Do you think it's time to integrate the Binondo culture in our educational system? Uh, so those are the I, questions, I, sir. Yeah, I think yung, you know, uh, one of the things that... Uh, uh, I, I have mentioned actually in my recommendation that we have a basic training as well as high technology training. So perhaps uh, one of the things that we can you know, is the basic training on test basic skills. Uh, basic train uh, uh, skills can be in in senior high school, but there's high technology training that has to be you know, uh, that has uh, I think that would be the that's that's a one good way of of. Of, of, of delineating what should be in TESDA, what should be in, in, in. But remember that uh, uh, TESDA as well uh, answers equity is like people who need basic training who are not in school, over age and all of that. So that can be TESDA as well, yung ano na yun. especially and these are done in communities and this will be sub, 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 uh, supervised by TESDA. So that's kinds of those kinds of training, the basic training for young, for in 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 school age groups can be done in in in, in to, to be incorporated perhaps in basic life skills and in in our in our uh, in, in, in basic education but for the out of uh, out of age uh, who needs retraining there will be a, uh, one of the things that we have uh, realized that we, we have to do continuous training because of the changes in technology yeah. and that cannot be done by, by basic training and that's one. The other group is high technology training. High precision, mining high precision equipment has, has, uh, requires training. And that's what sometimes we, we forget. Like, for example, in China, they have a very, one of the appreciation that mentioned by, by, by the by Apple CEO is that one of the things that people forget about China is that besides their high uh, technology, their training is very, uh, the, they are, uh, their workers can, can man high precision equipments, which requires specialized training as well. Uh, so those are the two things that has to be recognized in Tesla. There is this low level training for basic skills uh, uh, and high precision training for, for advanced uh, equipments. Uh, so that, 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 that has can that has been the, I agree that, uh, for those on, on, on school age, it can be done in basic education. Actually, we should be doing that in basic education. So we perhaps we should not uh, uh, take that out from TESDA for the long term. But today, it, it's it's still we still have people who are who needs uh, basic training. You know, yeah, that's one. The other one is I, I'm not very sure about what the binondo is that entrepreneurial. Culture. Binondo culture is is that that yes that yes sir entrepreneurial yeah yeah I think. Uh, uh i'm i'm not uh, very uh conversant on that but but entrepreneurial as i've said 
uh, it's a very complex thing, as, as I've seen many evaluation studies throughout the world, that uh, entrepreneurship is, a, is, is quite complex. Uh, building that up, uh, like for example, the, the, by the idea of Binondo culture is, is really a, why is it that called Binondo culture? Is that because there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, people who have uh, parents who have been doing that and all of that, uh, or are, uh, the, the, what I say it's complex because what we, what we see as standing up in entrepreneurships are people who have succeeded. We never have, uh, uh, we never find anyone doing entrepreneurship that did not succeed kasi nawala na sila sa, sa scene. So it's a very complex thing and I'm not, uh, I am afraid I'm not very, I'm, I just, what I have is really evaluations of entrepreneurship development programs in many countries. The literature of that is very much mixed. Uh, you can teach, but uh, I don't know if he, how much of that can be is, is can be imparted, uh, and 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 in schools or maybe imparted better in 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 family dinners or whatever rather than mm -hmm. schools. Uh, I, I, I was well, that's that's my take of that, and, and the only thing that I can uh, 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 is the is the evaluation studies that I've read about building entrepreneurship uh, uh, among among people. But definitely, what the the results of the evaluation is that you can't do that for the poor because uh, the poor has very complex issues. Uh, like uh, there are there may be success, successes among the poor, but the, it's, it's a very mixed issues because the poor is faced with a lot of issues. So turning entrepreneurs out of them uh, uh, will not generally work, as, as evaluation has been saying. Uh, uh, that's why uh, as a poverty alleviation, uh, uh, it may work for some, but not. it's not a sure bull thing. Uh, uh, they are facing a lot of risk that, that, that they're training them, adding to that the, the risk of entrepreneurship, uh, maybe it's just too much to expect. Yeah, I think that's my take uh, uh, from from what I've found. Thank you, I thank you, know. Doctor Babes. Yeah, uh, let me just abuse my privilege as a moderator. And before you you we we uh, uh, leave, sir. Let, let me just have. Uh, I'm just here. Sorry, idea. I'm just here. I'm just, sorry. I was attending to something. Yes, yes. So just your quick thought on the school voucher. Uh, yeah. Because in the past, the issue on school vouchers has always been that the cost of uh, private uh, school education and the subsidy is not uh, is not always uh, uh, enough. And uh, experience shows that uh, in the past there has been uh, low take uh, low take out or low budget utilization of, of the program. Um, and especially right now during the pandemic, during the pandemic when we have seen. Uh, large strobes of enrollees uh, shifting from private school to public school and the problem that uh, being that uh, a number of private schools have been closed uh, during the pandemic so sir just what's your take on on the on this issue on the school voucher uh, having seen that in your recommendation in your presentation earlier sir yeah we, we have been uh, about vouchers because uh, one thing is that you will never know what the student need uh, so in terms of training, like for example, we cannot prescribe to the student, uh, the, the parents and the student will know what's, not, what's right for him. So what we are actually say, saying is let financing follow the student. Don't mm -hmm. make financing choose the stu uh, where the student should be going because you don't know what's best for him. What's best for him is, is I think his parents will be the best judge of what's best for him. So you just let the financing follow the student. Don't uh, put money in a school so that the student will go there. No, uh, the student decides where to go and let the financing, if he is eligible, uh, follow him. Now, for example, if he can, if he goes to a private nearby private school, then uh, uh, he thinks that uh, it's better for him to be in a private school because he's he's, he's on the track. Uh, then let the financing follow that rather than forcing the student to go to public school where the track that he doesn't uh, that he likes is not there. 
for instance. So that's that. So that so if of course if there's no private school to go there, then that's that's an issue. Mm. The, the only thing that you yeah. have to do is is to beef up the private the public schools yeah, in terms of 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 uh, capacity to deliver the training that the students need. So is, that's that's the idea of the voucher. That I think the the idea of the voucher is that we should let the students choose where they study and the financing uh, follows him. Uh, you knew, knew, that's why uh, I think that's the, the efficient way of, of funding uh, funding students. Let the student choose kung anong tama sa kanya at sa kanya's parents, of course with his parents, uh, kung anong tama sa kanya, yeah. then financing follows. Uh, huwag natin ipil- unahan yung sudyante kung saan siya pupunta. Parang ganun yung... That's, that's, uh, that's, giving that's, them choice, sir. Giving them choice. Yeah, yeah. Basically, this choice because as I've said, no matter how good uh, you are, a predictor you are about the needs of the students, the best judge about what they need is always the parents and the students right. together. With with with, uh, with advice, of course, from 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 uh, from uh, whatever the, we can provide in terms of uh, coaching, in terms of choice of. But ultimately, it's the student and the parent will decide on where they will be student. So, wag mo pangunahan yon decision na yon. You just let the financing follow. That's why we we like the voucher because that's the nature of the voucher. Na no no. Ah. And, and uh, by the way, uh yung voucher of amount has to be uh, calibrated as well. Yeah. Y- yung ano noon. So no wag na masyadong isang amount lang because there there might be like for example for a for a very poor student, he might need a lot uh, more <laughs> a lot more than a richer student for instance to be able to go to a school so yun po yung, yun yung uh, that's the nice thing about and you can calibrate that in vouchers uh yun yung yung, yung, ano niya, yung uh, good uh, features of using a voucher to finance education thank you thank you Dr. Rebecca for that uh, uh, clarification our next question uh, i think is addressed to Dr. Jason uh, Alinsu Nurin uh, this is coming from, again, from Director Dan Agustin. Uh, his question is, uh, on labor markets, uh, are we so, why are we so land-based when we look into unemployment issue? Why won't we look at West Philippine seas and our other land sea resources? If we develop our outdated fishing industry, we not only solve unemployment, but also our malnutrition crisis. What are your thoughts? Uh, for Jason. Uh, hello. Hi, good morning. Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. I think, uh, okay, this question is a perfect example of how, of a wicked problem. How, let's say, for example, is food security is linked to the labor markets, to the agriculture sector, and to the basic provisions ng ating, uh, ng ating lipunan. So, uh, I'd like to respond as, a, as an academic, but I'm also trying to think of, uh, 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 get anecdotal examples from elsewhere. So uh, when I was a grad student, I've always wondered that, or uh, who are the richest, uh, let's say, professions in Europe, for example. And there were studies indicating that the farmers were among the richest in in the in their society, not because they possess the land, but because of an organizational arrangement among the farmers. So I think one response, which may indirectly touch on your question, is that. Um, one thing that we need to change the way we think in the Philippines is our relationship with the food. I think uh, Director Glenn would, be, Glenn would be able to provide more answers on this. Whenever Filipinos think about food, it's just the food on the table. We don't re- necessarily think about the, uh, the, the, the journey from, from roots to fruits of the, of the food that we eat. So in, in Europe, there's this particular example called Apelacion d'Origine Controle. Yung indicación geográfica típica, so which protects the production of certain groups of commodities. So it applies to cheeses, to to dairy, uh, to to, uh, to to wines, to a lot of products from garlic to tomatoes to squash. And one feature of that is that uh, these groups of uh, cooperatives of farmers, th- their goal is to, uh, whenever whenever the, these products are sold into them in the market, they have a uh, distinct labeling. Whenever, uh, when, whenever Filipinos go to the market, we cannot distinguish which products are actually being imported from China, from Taiwan, or from elsewhere. And it confounds our decision making. We'll just get the, the cheap one because they're the same anyway. So, but what if we change the way we think about food? We buy the food that supports the livelihood of my fellow Filipinos. 
So it might be, let's say, the, the onions from Ilocos might be uh, cheap, might be more expensive by five pesos than the ones imported from Taiwan, but we are supporting the livelihoods of our workers. So in Europe, you will see examples like this. Now, there are some chickens which are raised in France, uh, let's say, deboned elsewhere and packaged in a different country. So you see that how a product journeys throughout the continent. In the Philippines, we don't have the distinction. So uh, one thing that we can able, be able to see is that uh, on tayo ng focus on high quality products that are being marketed to the consumer. Right now, you'll see that most of the uh, discussions by the farmers that they, they get to be uh, uh, outdone by the competitors which are imported uh, agricultural commodities. I'm not an agricultural economist, so I'm saying this as an anecdote. But if we empower the consumers to know the information in advance whenever they purchase goods and services, it can definitely help us in, in, uh, in supporting the livelihood of these sectors. Um, yeah, I think in general, uh, it works for a lot of uh, commodities in Europe, like for example, a certain cheese can only be developed in a certain geographically defined region. And in, in effect, uh, these co cooperatives are actually much more powerful than local government units themselves because the geographical area is much more extensive. And uh, the even the political candidates that they endorse are quite po popular with their members. So in a way that these organization, uh, organizations of cooperatives are were able to guarantee, uh, because they cannot sell their products if they don't guarantee, uh, uh, um, say, labor standards as well for their workers. So I think that's one that's one thing that's missing. Aside from the purely market design, uh, uh, from the how we organize our producers, and how it bridges to uh, on how it goes to the table of the consumers, I think one thing that we need to see is how you know how information or the property rights of these goods and services can actually of these agricultural commodities can help our farmers. So it's a wicked problem. There's much thought about it, but I cannot unfortunately address about the West Philippine Sea. But mm -hmm. definitely, I think that's definitely <laughs> ours and. Uh, should find ways of um, uh, generating value out of that. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jason. Uh, I, our next question, I think, is addressed to uh, Dr. Beta. Uh, the question is uh, from Jason uh, Joseph Solis uh, Albir, Albirice from uh, CTU Argao Campus. Uh, his question is uh, your slide earlier on the MTB uh, MLE. Uh, and its implementation are not understood by parents and teachers. Do you think we need to bluntly rethink the uh, MTB uh, MLE program where we need to consider the sentiments of parents? Uh, that, that I think that's the gist of his first question. And his second question is, uh, do you think we need further reform on language education curriculum where these children should be educated into speaking second international language like Spain, French, or Mandarin uh, starting at the primary level so that our country can have sufficient labor force for bilingual BPO. Dr. Beta? Yeah, I, I, yeah the, the, this, this the misunderstanding about MTBL is really, uh, I think there are two parts of the question. So the first, uh, our uh, stand on MTBL is that it's a fine uh, policy, but I think the issue was really on people misunderstanding its objective. The object, uh, uh, my major, major argument is that when a child goes to school, he only brings two things. One is his own intellect, uh, is born with him, and his language of expression. So what we are actually trying to emphasize that MTBLE is trying to use his language of expression in learning. It's not about redeeming a language. So that to facilitate, like for example, if you teach, if you teach anything, like if you teach social studies in a language that's foreign to a student in, 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 in the lower level, double he has to learn the content as he has to learn the language with which is being taught. But if it is being taught in the language that he already knows, he will get it right away. Isa lang yung kanyang problema, content lang. So that's why the policy is that at the beginning level, you should be using the, the language of expression of the child. Because it cripple mo kaagad yun. For example, tututun ka na yung sino nag i sa mga bata? Kundi lang yung mga anak ng mga yayaman, mayroong TV sa bahay. And all. How about those things who are not uh, exposed to those kinds of conversations? Wala sila, dihado ka agad sila. 
So that's that's basically uh, my point that we are trying the policy is trying to use the language of expression of the child when he goes to school. Of course, when he he when he after learning his uh, basic uh, la, uh, the language and and, and is, is the basics, he can learn anything, any other second language, third language, and all of that. And 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 we are for that uh, because as I'm sabi ng mga ano eh, uh, uh, sabi ng question is that there are uh, you, you will be working with other uh, cultures, other languages and like BPOs, but you can learn that in higher levels. But don't uh, impose uh, the a foreign language at the lower levels while the child is still learning the basic content. In union, that's actually what we should be emphasizing. That's what MTB is all about. You teach a child in the language he's familiar with so that his problem is only content, not uh, he has to learn the language so which is being taught and the content. Though, and the, the lawa agad yung problema niya. Yun, mag maganda yun sa mga batang exposed, for instance, sa English yung parents niya magsasalita, na exposed yung bata. How about yung estudyante na hindi ganyan yung parents? Or walang TV sa bahay, o walang ano na that he can listen to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walang exposure niya. So, ma ma nahihirapan siya kasi wala siyang exposure. No, no. So, he does, 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 does do it. So, I have no uh, issue about learning a second language or a third language or uh, mm -hmm. uh when he is already established in 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 in, in basic things in in in, in basic education uh, actually we should be encouraging that and uh, and we don't even want uh, we don't even need to encourage that because some of the some of our uh, uh, gen c already need, uh, knows the need of to learn other languages by themselves they are studying it uh, because of the need na hindi mo na kailangan ng encourage no 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 so what MTB is saying is that don't mix that up at the basic level. Make let the child learn basic things at his own, at the language of his own expression. Para makaka interaction ng maayos. Walang barrier. Yun po yung, yun po yung gusto namin sabihin doon. So, hindi yun malina wakala ng mga tao yung MTB is nagre-redeem ko ng language. No, it's, it's trying to facilitate instruction uh, in the language that the child understands. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Ibeta. Uh, our next question is uh, addressed to Dr. Jason uh, again. Would your research also elaborate on the type of uh, jobs per sector, uh, example, industry, services, and agriculture? Do you think that might provide insights into the quality and pay, including number of hours work? The type of jobs could also be important for labor mobility and options. For those in the agricultural agriculture sector, still employs around twenty percent. Uh, Dr. Jason, uh, thank you. Um, I think this is a very interesting question. We have already done some analysis on this, uh, but we still have to formalize it, put it in a table, and analyze it further. Um, we did have um, what we noticed is that the agriculture sector, your know, average working hours, as compared to industry and services, actually lower, and your average pay, uh, we also have taken a look at the, what they call this, the, the payment schemes employed predominantly in each sector. And the agriculture sector must predominant yung mga peace rates or uh, the reason I think, one of the reasons why uh, the agriculture sector renders on average, that's an average working hours as compared to other sectors is because iba yung payment schemes dito. Um, mas maraming peace rates or maram, mas maraming binabayaran on a, on a seasonal basis because a lot of the commodities are seasonal. I think the other finding which we are able to uh, service out is yung, yung extent of human capital in each sector. We, we've noticed that in the, those workers employed in the agriculture sector, uh, there's a greater proportion of, there's a lesser, as compared to the other two sectors, mas makakaunti yung college graduates as compared to the other two. But I think there are, of course, distinctions and regional variations. So, but I think it would be interesting to show it in the succeeding uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jason. Our next question is uh, addressed to Dr. Glenn Gregorio. Uh, how can LGUs promote community gardens as a way to increase the adoption of urban agriculture? What incentives can LGUs give the owners of vacant plots or lands for use as community vegetable gardens? The concept of urban agriculture is a very good 
is very good, but the space is to use is the constraint of most uh, urban dwellers. Uh, Dr. Gregorio, uh, can you respond hey, to uh, the question? Thank you for that question. Actually, that's the whole uh, um, emphasis I want to do in my presentation. Policy imperatives, kasi as I mentioned, uh, may plantito, plantito tayo, naging fad na lang yung urban gardening, barats nawawala siya. But once it's institutionalized, it's become uh, part of the municipal, uh, municipality ordinance to, to have an urban agriculture, then it will be there. Then the local government will, will identify the area and uh, i part yan ng, ng comprehensive uh, land use plan ng municipio then they will have the area example the plaza or even the municipal building you could plant the we could do urban or they call it the landscape uh, urban uh, edible landscape to plant papaya instead of roses there and iba so combination yan ng, ng ganun. then how to encourage so with that institutionalized there will be funding to help out the barangays and help out the the people and this urban gathering, kahit malit ang lugar mo, if you have a small area, then you have to do the modular. Yung smaller area lang, you could, you could design it modular. So you don't need to plant a big garden. So that's the say. And how could the LGU help? Of course, they could uh, provide uh, the, the techniques, how to plant. Because as I mentioned, gardening is a knowledge intensive. Even planting, akala mo, pag tanim mo, you, you get the fruits after two months. You have to do it every day. You have to implement it. Provide good seeds. Provide some inputs. Hanggang masana ng tao. Continuous training na yan. And you could even implement like those with vacant plots. There should be an ordinances from the municipality that it should be planted with garden. If you could not plant garden there, uh, those who are very passionate youth could uh, develop that that lot in the subdivision. Of course, there's a contract that they will not uh, uh, put houses there, but they will just make it beautiful. So the lot owner uh, will be happy because their, their lot will be cleaned. At the same time, it will be uh, generating some fun for the youth or they could even rent it out for them for para my, my parasol. So it's just a matter of uh, implementing an ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think in the interest of our time, uh, we'll probably entertaining uh, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, so this next question is uh, for Dr. Arbeta. Uh, do you think that training students on digital skills such as using productivity software tools uh, such as Canva, Python, could become a game changer in improving the country's present state of uh, education. Sir? Uh, definitely. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the future. And I would, I would suppose that uh, exposing and teaching students uh, as early as possible to interact and be comfortable with technology is, is, is key. But uh, we should be thinking about expanding uh, access for everyone. So that's as, as I have shown you the data, uh, most of our public school students are on paper. So that's, that's a, uh, so they, are, they don't have, uh, that means that they don't have facilities at their home. So the only way that we can is, is creating public, uh, public facilities to expose all the students to, to, to this to technology. And uh, um, that should be our aim. Uh, it's not uh, because if we just let it, let it, uh, 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 happen without intervention, it will create, uh, as, as the pandemic has already shown, it will exacerbate ex inequality. So because uh, students in public school don't have access to those kinds of things. Uh, only in private schools do we find that. So, but more and more important to me is really uh, the basis of being comfortable with technology is good basic education. So be uh, so we uh, we should go back to that. As I've said, we have problems in our basic education. We should go back to that so that uh, the the comfort of using technology will come naturally if you are trained well and you have access to it. And so that's, that's that those are the two things. You have been trained well with basic things of your 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 quant quantitatives and 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 because technology is mostly uh, all this. Uh, uh, Canva and, and programming languages are uh, requires logic, logical thinking, which has to be built uh, in, in in basic education and all, and and all of of, of this. So, so 
uh, exposure uh, and access should be should be critical uh, for everyone. Uh, yeah, it, there has to be a, a massive uh, uh, intervention such that uh, access for everyone will happen. Because as I've said, you've already seen that our education system only in private schools do you have some semblance of online uh, learning. Uh, most of our students are in paper uh, for public schools. That's a uh, hurdle okay. that you have to 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 pass. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have one more one um one uh, one more question for before we we uh, we end this Q and A program. Uh, to uh, Director Pam and or Andre uh, of CPBRD. Uh, the question is uh, from from Jubels. In your study assessment, uh, is the syntax uh, is syntax implementation uh, is more on revenue generating measure or is it equally effective in reducing uh, cigarette uh, consumption? Uh, let me also add one more question to that. Uh, can, can you just uh, your thoughts on the quality of submission of LGUs with regards to the compliance in the in the use of the earmark uh, revenues uh, from uh, seed taxes? So, so, uh, Pam or Andre? Uh, allow me to answer on the second question, and I will leave the question of Jubels on whether syntax implementation is more revenue generating or reducing cigarette consumption, because I think this was covered by Etre. So on the compliance of local governments as to the reports, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, that is a main challenge. That's why we actually need to strengthen uh, monitoring and evaluation um, of how uh, earmarked uh, revenues to LGUs are being uh, utilized. So, um, part on uh, every quarter, the LGUs are required to submit to, sub, to, to submit or to post actually uh, to submit to the DB, to the DBM regional offices and to post their uh, reports on refund utilization and status of projects and accomplishments uh, in their respective uh, websites. Even to post it in conspicuous public public places, you no, know, for transparency. Up and accountability purposes. But even the um, special audit reports by COA has noted that uh, the submission of these reports have not been faithfully adhered to by the uh, local government units. So, uh, frankly speaking, actually, we have tried to get in touch with the regional offices just to get a sense on whether the local governments are actually submitting the quarterly reports. So compliance is actually rather rather low and also the regularity or frequency of submissions is something that has to be to be improved on. The good thing um, now is that the DBM I think is trying to work on a mechanism that can improve the monitoring. So hopefully it will also improve the compliance of the local governments so that the reports can be better used for the oversight no? and the regular assessment of the use of these earmark funds. Edrin? Ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, the syntax reform is a uh, uh, health measure. Uh, rather than a revenue measure, but um, given that the design of the tax structure of the syntax is based on uh, sound uh, principles, and as he, as I discussed earlier, um, sticky, um, um, sticky yung demand ng ano ng cigarette. So I think it works both ways. It's an effective um, policy to reduce cigarette consumption. And also to uh, generate revenues uh, for the government. Thank you, thank you, Pam and Edre. Uh, I think we have uh, one more uh, uh, time for one one last question. Uh, this question is uh, addressed to uh, Sir Raymond in uh, Australia. Uh, the question is: Which specific part provision, key issues of the national uh, HRH 
mm-hmm. or human resource for health master plan does your study try to deal with or provide uh, input uh, uh, input for uh, sir uh, raymond okay po um thank you for for that question po no um sa study po namin one of our policy bases is the national hrh master plan 2020 to 2040 and uh, meron po mga issues to on mentioned that continuously challenge our healthcare sector and una po doon ay meron daw po tayong um, limited information hrh data and i think our study can really help po uh, in providing baseline baseline information po especially sa ating um, hospitals in our Metro Manila, Metro Cebu, and Metro Davao hospitals because meron nga po tayong limited information. So our study can provide po yung uh, baseline information pagdating sa decent working conditions sa ating mga hospitals sa metropolitan areas. And then pangalawang challenge doon ay meron daw po tayong limited co- collaboration sa ating healthcare industry. That's why we partnered with the DOH, of course the lead agency po, and of course the HRH Network Philippines. Um, this is a multi-sectoral body po composed of 18 government agencies and private organizations. And we also present during their quarterly meeting and we also get their insights, their comments about a research project. And I think it's a good avenue to um, collaborate with the healthcare industry, not just with the OH, not just with Dole, but um, in essence, we are uh, targeting as well a whole of society approach when it comes to our healthcare issues and challenges in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we wrap up this uh, session, uh, let, let me just thank our uh, presenters uh, uh, for uh, taking time and responding to the questions. Uh, we hope that uh, we will be having this kind of engagement again in the future. So uh, on that note, uh, I'll be turning it over to Sheila for, uh, for the reminders and uh, closing session. So thank you uh, and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um... Edi Bangsal for that uh, your excellent facilitation of the uh, open forum and our sincere thanks and appreciation to our, to our excellent panel of speakers. Um, just to cap um, our uh, discussion for today, may I give um, brief um, seconds, one minute to each of our uh, presenters for some brief final remarks. You may have something to say before we close this open forum, starting with uh, Dr. Glenn Gregorio. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, thank you. I, I just want to say that uh, we want really uh, urban agriculture or agriculture innovation to be in place. We'll take the advantage of the COVID-19 as a way that we realize the importance of agriculture, the importance of food. So it may go away after we go back to normal, but once we implement it in, into law or into a municipal ordinances, then it will be, it will spread like fire and everyone will be happy. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat din po, Dr. Uh, Glenn. And uh, may we hear from Edre. Uh, Edre would, would have something uh, to say, you know, um, <laughs> as your brief final remarks, then uh, followed by uh, uh, Director Pam. Uh, sorry, I have nothing to add, ma'am, but thank you for uh, inviting again the city here. Thank you very much. Okay. Pam? Yes, thank you, Doc Sheila. Um, maybe among the recommendations uh, that we can prioritize to improve uh, health, no health conditions, since we are we were looking at uh, earmarking for for health, is to really strengthen the capacities of our, our public health facilities. So maybe uh, we we just look at the budget allocations and utilization of these programs, but uh, indeed I think there is a need to look. Uh, uh, more deeply, no? more in depth, uh, at each program, uh, evaluate each program and how it can be improved. So, also we need to um, do an oversight of the H HFEP and build on the capacities really also of the DOH in terms of procurement, in terms of monitoring and evaluation. Because sometimes if the funds are there, but uh, the bottlenecks are you know on the operational side, 
So we have to, to work on the capacities also of the DOH and maybe look go beyond that, look into how the DOH central office can improve, can help the local governments improve the health systems at the local level. Thank you very much, Director Pam and Edre. And may we hear from uh, Dr. Jason uh, Alinsonorin? Okay. Um, probably I'll just uh, re re uh, restate what I mentioned earlier about uh, the need or we underscore the need for inclusive labor policies which are worker-centered. Uh, we need to upskill and reskill those at the fringes while also protecting them from displacement and exclusion. I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing if you want a labor force that's productive and future-oriented. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jason. And uh, Mr. Raymond Australia? Thank you, Paul, uh, Olet, for this opportunity. Um, as a final word, I think we need to uh, empower more policy researchers in the government for us to be able to provide more uh, evidence-based and data-driven policy recommendations to our stakeholders. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, acknowledge all our healthcare workers in the Philippines because we experience and we um, acknowledge all their effort uh, in these very trying times of COVID-19 pandemic. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. And to all our Thank speakers you. and BIDS. Thank you very much to Raymond. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Anisette Orbeta, sir. Okay, uh, thanks, Sheila. I th I thank you for uh, the, this plot, um, sharing the, allowing us to share the paper. And I'm and, and uh, uh, very pleased to have the fruits of SERPI coming out uh, after so many years uh, of networking of researchers and uh, and sharing uh, our papers is just basically the, the idea so that we can have uh, uh, our policy makers and decision makers can have a uh, better basis for their decisions. So that's, that's, that's really, uh, in terms of education, uh, I, I'd like, just like to make this parting word that it, it's not uh, only how much education you are willing to impart to our students, but uh, we should also do the other way around but also that perhaps more importantly, how much education are we willing to take uh, from the outcomes of our uh, of our system so that we can improve it? So that's the only way we improve, right? Uh, if you are being rated, uh, you 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 know where where to go and all of that. That's the only way you can improve. So that 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 the reverse education of our education system should also be uh, should also be cultivated so that we can improve and move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edbeta. Friends, let us give all of our uh, speakers a, a virtual round of applause. Okay, at this point, let me uh, reveal the winners of our poll. Okay, and they are uh, from Webex, Ghana, Marie's uh, Baginguito, Rick, uh, Luke Garcia and Margaret Galuna, and from Facebook, Charlotte, uh, for the Lawn Roslin and Maxine Estinor. Um, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we finally close, we have some announcements. Okay, so you can access all the presentations from uh, today's webinar from the PIDS website, as well as from um, the SERPI uh, website. Also, please, please um, answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after uh, this webinar. We will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important uh, for us to improve our webinars. And um, please also regularly visit our website and social media pages. Um, SERPI has a Facebook account as well as well, and its own um, uh, website. And uh, we also have a YouTube channel, PIDS has a YouTube channel, which uh, contains all the recordings of our uh, past uh, webinars. Okay, and flash on the screen are, are our webinars, uh, remaining webinars for uh, this month. On May 17, um, we will have the PSCN FSI Symposium on Circular Economy in the Philippines and APEC. On May 19, uh, we will have our webinar uh, which will discuss the assessment of the implementation of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act. And on May 26, we will have the launch of the PIDS book, The Philippines Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, Learning from Experience and Emerging Stronger to Future Shocks. Okay, 
And uh, we would like to announce that Sir P has a new website which comes with more mm -hmm. user-friendly features such as easier navigation and advanced search facility, citation monitoring, and seamless interface with social media platforms platforms. So just go to serp-p.pids.gov.ph to access SERP. And it is accessible on all devices on desktop, laptop, and mobile. Okay. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from um, uh, the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. So friends, this concludes uh, the kickoff forum of the SERP Knowledge Sharing Webinar Series. Please watch out for our succeeding webinars. And thank you once again for joining us. And remember to vote wisely on May 9. <laughs> Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank